Hello and welcome to my new podcast, Flex and Chill. This is a podcast about, you guessed it, movies and just chilling and just getting to know the people who will talk movies on the internet. And for my very first episode, I have here Mike Hilty. Hello. How's it going? I'm very well. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I feel honored to be part of this maiden voyage with you. So. Same. Like I'm, I'm honored for all the help you've given me over the past couple of weeks. So, yeah. you know, it felt just natural to have you as my first guest. Well, all right, let's, let's do this. Let's, let's get weird. Let's, yes. Let's go. So just to get everybody familiar. So, you know, this podcast will really be two things, us getting to know each other and us, you know, chilling and then talking about movies because that's what we both love. And let's start with this. So, Mike, if you had a Tinder profile and give us some basic details about you, share as little or as much as you want, what would it say? So this is a little embarrassing for me to admit, but since we're in a safe space, I'm going to admit this to you. Okay. I've never had I've never had a Tinder profile. So That's what fine. am I lo- what am I looking for with this? Are you on Tinder or were you on Tinder once upon a time? Once upon a time. I haven't been on Tinder for the last almost six years. And basically it's just, you know, uh where are you based? If you want your mm. height, you know, your hobbies, mm. and basically just make you, you know, make yourself as re- uh, relatable as possible so people Got swipe it. right on you. We don't ah. want to start swiping left. We want swiping right. Got it. Okay. So I am based in the U.S. in the northern suburbs of Chicago. Mm-hmm. I am 5'5", five five, I guess. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm a pretty short guy, unfortunately. Um, I've got... Two kids, uh, mm-hmm. a six-year-old and a one and a half-year-old. The six-year-old would be remiss if I didn't say six and three quarters because she gets <laughs> kind of pissy about that, which that's fine. I, I totally get it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I I work in an HR department, Ooh. you know, which isn't quite as fun as I thought it would be, but it's um, I work for a food ingredients company, so. If you're looking for something where it's like, and eh, let's let's go with like weird spices, not just regular table salt. Mm-hmm. If you yeah. want like Hawaiian black sea salt or, uh-huh. you know, coarse Arabian sea salt or something like that, that's where you'd come to us uh, for things like that. So um, so that's fun. Working in the food industry is is interesting because things are always changing. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of one of those fun industries where things are always evolving and there's always something to talk about with food. Um, mm-hmm. With all due respect to anybody who who's in an industry that's pretty static or anything like that. That's one of the things that I loved about working in IT as well mm-hmm. when I sold IT equipment because there was always something changing. There was always something evolving. Like when oh, I yeah. first worked in the IT industry, the big thing that was changing was the cloud. Yes. And everybody was nervous about the cloud. Like, well, okay, yeah, it's it's new, it's different, but there's no need to be nervous about it. We just need to figure figure out what we need to do with it. And now everything is cloud based. Yeah, every everything is cloud based, and now everybody is having the same conversation with AI. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. That's again, I, I just I love that, and that's kind of one of the things that I do love about movies and tv as well as that there's always something to talk about with that so beyond movies and tv which tv as of late has been the bigger hobby of yeah. mine i i mean the biggest other uh hobby that i have is sports i'm a big sports fan mm-hmm. um we're in the throes of the middle of the nba basketball season now mm-hmm. and i and the american football playoffs are are just starting to ramp up right now so mm-hmm. so yeah those though i mean i i feel like that's a pretty good start for that's for a, a decent tinder, start a, di- a tinder profile even though i've never had no like to be fair i i know people in real life that's they've never been on tinder because they've been either in a relationship for the longest time or they always meet somebody you know more or- organically and they don't need the internet so but, no but, you know but i, I get it though that 
internet dating is just so much easier to do, especially for time constraints. Because admittedly, I have done online dating before, but I I got rejected a lot because I have the face of radio, as you so eloquently put it. So Mm -hmm. I was talking I, about myself just to be just to be clear, I'm not that mean. <laughs> um, even if you were, um, I I would still you know call you a a dear friend of mine, so it's all good. But I know for for me, I got I got rejected a lot. And also the couple of times that I had dates from online dating, they both were, were terrible. Just, Okay. I, I have some, like one in particular, I had like a really bad experience with, and that's when I was like, I'm done. And then shortly after that, I met my wife at, of all, or I, I met the person that would eventually become my wife in all places, church, like never thought that I would meet my wife at church, which cool. Okay, that's that's So just many how things, things work. so many things I just want to ask a question about. So let's Well, start with this, right? So go go for it. Yeah, let's hear you've it. you've had some online dating, even though it wasn't a Tinder, but you've been on you know online dating this as you said rejected several times. I noticed, and I don't know if it's just an American thing or if it's just a now worldwide thing. Apparently, if you are a shorter guy or on the shorter side, that's also a factor. You know, so Yes, from your experience, is it okay? All right. absolutely. It's a factor because it is, I think, particularly at with younger women, Mm so women in their 20s and even like in their early 30s, the goal is to have somebody that's taller than them. And I, I totally get it, -hmm. especially Mm -hmm. since a lot of women, they like to wear heels when they go out and everything like that. They don't want. It's it's a little embarrassing for Yeah. for them and I can't blame them for that but it's it's tough because the the 5 5 thing does does kind of hurt and then also well you know the the face it it also kind of hurts my my cause as well so I'm I'm lucky and very fortunate that my wife puts up with me as much as she does Well, from where I'm sitting, your face looks perfectly fine. Like Now, 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 now. Per perfectly fine. <laughs> I, I love that ringing endorsement. Thank yes, you. I know, right? Thank you. I, Look, I appreciate that. it comes from a person who this is, you know, the most he's ever gotten until I met my girlfriend. This was, you know, this basically was, you know, I had a different issue online dating as Oh, <laughs> yeah. I used to, you know, I am. Well, 184, five centimeters, which would be six and I think half when it comes to American freedom units. So Dear I don't Lord, have that problem. dear But Lord. yeah, well, again, six, you know, six feet and just not even one inch. So I'm not like six half. No, no, no. I'm not a basketball player, <laughs> but I'm, I'm quite old. However, for most of my adult life, or well, for most of my life, I've been obese. Like I'm talking heavy obese. In my, I don't mind saying this, in my heaviest, I used to weigh, in pounds, that would be 300, maybe 20-ish pounds. So, and I've managed to lose most of it over the past several years. So, but that was always my big problem. I was the, hey, I'm you're not really a date material, but, you know, I can be friends with you. Like, you know, you have a, you have a fine face and... Mm You know, hmm so let's be friends. So I can definitely relate to some of these struggles, especially online. mm hmm Like, yeah. I'm I'm actually quite frankly I'm I'm having the same struggle actually Mm hmm I'm I am by by medical standards I am considered morbidly obese I'm pretty so sure there's I was not too. so there's nothing like going to the doctor and being like you're not just obese you're obese like Mm-hmm. oh thanks I've had you guys many of these where the doctor was trying to tell me, oh, have you considered dropping some of these pounds? I was like, yeah, but it's not no that hard. It's not easy. like no i i haven't considered it i just want to be considered obese and have people look at me my entire life you know th thanks for thanks for bringing that up doc that's probably why a lot of obese people don't like going to the doctor because you know and you said it perfectly is that for doctors they're just like have you tried losing weight i'm like Mm-hmm. yes fucker
I have tried losing weight. Mm -hmm. It's it's harder than you think. It's not like it's not like I could just diet and exercise and just watch the pounds come off. I've got feelings, god damn it. And mm -hmm. when I when I see like the weight's not coming off as quick as I want, I you know, I struggle with that. I've always said, and many people have always said this the same thing. If it was easy, nobody would be obese. There would be literally, if it was as easy to have a six pack and if it was as easy to be slim for every single person, obviously there would be no fat people, no obese people around because every, you know, it would be so easy, but it's not. But, well, yeah. but, but the other thing too, not only that is mm -hmm. not only if it were easy to mm -hmm. keep or to lose weight, nobody would be, would be obese. But the other thing, too, is that if people are so concerned about eating healthy and things mm -hmm. like that, why are the most inexpensive things out there the worst things for you mm -hmm. as well? Like, why is organic food like two or three times more expensive, even though it's quote unquote better for you? Why is it that McDonald's is super cheap, but... Somewhere like in the States, like a kind of healthy-ish mm -hmm. place would be considered like a Panera, which is like salads and food and like sandwiches and things like that. Um, why is that grossly more expensive mm -hmm. and quite frankly, doesn't taste as good as the salty McDonald's French fries that are also significantly cheap? Well, that's the thing, isn't it? It's all about a mass production. It's about, you know, buying it cheap, buying it in bulk. And then you know, that's that's how McDonald's, KFCs, all those, you know, usual suspects can stay in business. That's how they can use, can sell you cheap fries, cheap chicken or a burger, even though that's not really well, a burger. <laughs> it's well, but not only that in the U.S. with fast food, there's fast food literally everywhere. And also oh, yeah. I, I recently had this discussion with somebody at work about mm -hmm. if if you go somewhere in the United States and you get what's considered like a large mm -hmm. drink or something mm -hmm. like that, a large drink to us is like 30, 40 ounces of, of soda, which okay. if if I do that math. That seems like a that, that's like a liter, liter two. That it seems like a lot. I know ounces are quite a lot. <laughs> so, but again, I don't operate with freedom units, uh, which. All right. So, for like, for example, at my local gas station, they okay. offer a 44 ounce drink. Okay. So, to equate that, 44 US fluid ounces is 1.3 liters. Wow. So, most other places around the world, their large is like our small. small. Yeah, here, here large would be like half a liter. So yeah. that would be about, I, I would imagine like 10, out, 10, 11 ounces maybe. And that would be like large. Yeah. So I showed, I showed this coworker of mine. Uh, there is lots of videos on YouTube where people compare the mm -hmm. sizes of fast food from all different places around the world. Yeah. And one of them was, hey, let's compare KFC mm -hmm. in the UK to KFC in the United States. Mm -hmm. And the the differences are, are gross. It's disgusting, actually. And it's kind of embarrassing. But also, this is kind of the nature of living in the US, where mm -hmm. competition is king and capitalism is a thing. And let's make a buck off of people's insecurities as as a person who still has yet to travel to the U to the United States, well, I do live in the UK, so that would be weird. <laughs> but yeah, I still haven't, you know, traveled. Out, but I would desperately want to go and visit some places. I yeah, I keep hearing this. I have this. I have a friend here who just went to see went to the Florida to the Universal Studios for about two weeks, and she enjoyed it. She said it was so great. Like she, they, you know. They've been to the Disney, they've been to the Universal Studios and all, all over the place. But she mentioned that every time they would eat something, it usually they would just split like one portion of, let's say they had a burgers and fries. You know, they are, you know, two reasonably uh, healthy, skinny-ish people. I would imagine like the norm, normal, you know, normal looking people. 
And even then I was like, yeah, we just played one portion and it was more than enough for both of us. And I thought, yeah, I keep hearing stories like these from people who visit like, you know, America and they, and they are used to the cuisine or even the fast food here. It's because, yeah, as you said, your large is super mega large. Well, and then not only that, and this is something that I've learned a little bit through my wife and a little bit through John Oliver, the mm. sheer amount of sugar and salt yes. we yes. put on anything, everything here is grotesque. It's everything has added sugar in it. And that's why as of late, you know, I'm putting my food industry cap on. Mm -hmm. That's why as of late, we'll be like, yeah, the FDA needs to have you all put in there how mm -hmm. much added sugar is in stuff as opposed to just total amount of sugar. Because if you put just how much sugar occurs, you know, kind of naturally or what's yep. just, that's different from, oh, we've got like a solid couple pounds of sugar that we've added to this to make it taste better. Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay. I I have a feeling here it's due to well the UK has a bit of a bit of a hard time right now because of we had the Brexit, which not a not a good time. Mm -hmm. But that's a conversation for maybe later. Mm -hmm. But the EU for all its flaws, and it is a flawed system, but it has many benefits. And I think the regulatory part, what many people rail against, is protecting us, really. You know, because those regulations, they actually tell you if, you know, if a bread has that much sugar or whatever, it cannot be called that. So, you know, I and I think part of it must be that I would imagine like there must be, you know, restrictions here on food and what goes into the food. And that's why we don't really have many products readily available unless we go to like, even in where I live, there's a store that sells only american things like candies and mm. sodas and like even cereal i've been there once once or twice and i think i bought a few things and yeah they were mostly very sugary things which i love me some sugar i love me some chocolate but sometimes but, it's like but maybe not as much, much. yeah maybe not as much as what americans do with it that's kind of the bummer about yep american food is that when you go abroad and like when I went to New Zealand, mm -hmm. I, I was like, this food tastes so plain. And my my wife was like, that's because there's not like a, a dump truck of sugar yep. on this. I was like, oh, you know, that makes sense. And I was like, well, maybe I just need to get over it because even though it doesn't taste as good, it's still filling and it's probably better for my health mm -hmm. as well. Well, since we now fix the food industry, let me actually ask you about this. So you mentioned that you were in IT and now you're in the food industry, right? So mm -hmm. what motivated that shift? Because I would imagine that's a fairly big career shift. It is. So in between that, so here, here's what happened. I was, I predominantly have been in IT sales. Okay. That's, that's my career. IT sales is really hard though, mm -hmm. because it takes a lot of right place, right time, Yep. right situation like yep. that's that's what a lot of it is and it's also a lot of it is based on on things that you can't control i can't control that amazon gives you free shipping for things for inferior product so i was in it sales and my base salary for mm -hmm. it sales i'm not gonna say who who the the place was because i'm i hope that their base price or base you know salary has gone up was twenty five thousand dollars, which okay. is nothing. So you have to make a lot of you got to make it all on commissions and yeah. you know bonuses and things like that. So I wasn't making enough money. So mm -hmm. I and I had had a relative that recently that had gotten diagnosed with cancer. So I mm -hmm. felt the need to do something with that. So I went into um, I went to work for the American Cancer Society okay. as a person who planned fundraisers mm -hmm. and. I I realized pretty quick that I don't think I'm cut out for nonprofit because it's way more cutthroat than I thought Ooh. it was going to be. Um, and I had a buddy of mine who I was looking to get out of that. And I had a buddy of mine who works in graphic design um, who is actually going to be designing all the like logos and things like that for mm -hmm. this podcast venture that I'm doing. Um, 
he he worked at this food place and was like, yeah, we're looking for salespeople. You want me to throw, uh, throw your hat in the ring? I was like, yes, that would actually be great. And yeah, I, I worked there. I went back to it briefly as a sales coach and same thing happened where I was like, I'm not making any money with this and I'm not, it's, I, I got the itch to go back to food. So And you went from sales to HR, which I don't know, maybe I'm being daft, but that doesn't seem like a, there's some sort of correlation between those or is there? So the, the correlation is I, my HR background is predominantly in training. Okay. And so I went, I got my master's degree in training and developments, Mm -hmm. um, you know, back uh, 10 years ago, Oh, uh, we're getting old. 10 years ago, but what I did with that was I got into sales And I recognized that we don't have a good training structure. Mm-hmm. So I parlayed my sales experience into a sales training experience. And then that's how I it kind of evolved into being part of the HR department. And Okay. so, so I was in sales, then I did sales training. And then that became, hey, why don't you do things like organizational change Mm -hmm. for us and, and train and do some training stuff with us too. And And that's, now that's I would the goal. That's the goal ultimately would be to do more stuff with just training specifically. I see. I see. All right. So now are you at a place where you actually enjoy your work? Yes, it's tough because Mm -hmm. yes. there's a lot of change going on where Mm -hmm. I work. So it's tough, but I'm in a good spot right now. Good. You know, as as frustrating as, as it can be, but Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think one of the things that kind of makes it okay for where I work at, you know, I work with great people. I work with interesting products. And then also I've got things to do outside of work that I'm, I'm passionate about. And mm-hmm. that's, that makes a difference. I have, I have, I used to be one of those people who I would work until like 11 or 12 o'clock at night every mm-hmm. day, but kids And hobbies change that. And yeah. I'm grateful that I'm no longer in that place. That when I'm done with work, I'm I am unless something comes up, I am done yeah. with work. Which I think this is almost a uh, you know attitude here in well, I will say in Europe, where I believe even France has now laws where you can be offline, right to be offline, <laughs> basically. that the work uh, cannot really contact you once you are done working. Because I think now COVID, you know, has changed many people when it comes to their attitude, how much do they actually need, you know, what they want to do with the rest of their life. Because as we've now learned, it might be shorter than we realize, you know, Yeah. anything can happen. So I've I've heard many stories of people cutting back on their full time hours and going from full time to let's say working three days a week because they still you know even on the sixty percent of their salary they still make enough and they are much happier doing as you mentioned like some charity work or some sort of hobby that you know fulfills them. But see, speaking of the charity work, you mentioned the nonprofit was quite a cutthroat place. That, do you dare to share any more details like as to no nothing like you know I wouldn't say nothing that obviously would you compromise don't want to yes yeah but like how 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 do you, how do you mean what what exactly so when you are fundraising for a cause that's important to a lot of people mm-hmm. you don't realize how many other causes out there that warrants people's attention that need need money Yeah. Okay. so um like a good example of that is i look at I, I look at an episode of South Park, for example, Mhm. where they talk about how, like, Cartman, unfortunately, accidentally gets AIDS. Oh. And when he fundraises to get more money for AIDS, people are like, yeah, but it's AIDS. It's Mhm. not cancer or anything like that. 
And he's so frustrated about that. Mm -hmm. To that extent, it was never like that specific. But the problem is, is that, okay, with the U.S. and capitalism being a thing, mm -hmm. there's all kinds of different causes that people could invest in now. And we have a finite amount of money because everybody's grossly in debt right yeah. now. So what are you going to give your money to? Are you going to give your money to, you know, people who need who need food? Are you going to give money to cancer research? Are you going to give money to animal shelters? Are mm. you going to give money to veterans? Like, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. So you can't give away the all the money that you have to these causes and all these billionaires who are hoarding all this money, mm -hmm. they're not going to give enough to sustain and solve all these problems either. So, mm -hmm. so you got to pick and choose and you got to make these tough decisions. And it's the same thing with businesses. Businesses, they're going to give money to causes that their employees are passionate about or if it makes sense for branding purposes for their job or yeah. for, for their company. So not every company out there is passionate about giving money to cancer research. And that may sound callous, but it's also the nature of the situation mm -hmm. that companies have a certain amount, a finite amount of resources and money to support causes. There's nothing wrong with that. It is just the nature of the situation. So yeah. And this is where this is a main reason why I was brought in for this role is so I can do and I can give a little bit of my sales acumen for mm -hmm. that. But it's different. It's hard also. And it's hard corralling people to. Ra to rationalize what what do I what would I rather do? Would I rather donate my money or would I rather donate my time? Yeah, that's a that's also a tough thing to sell as well, which is why recruiting volunteers is hard as well. Because you really got to be passionate and it's it's kind of like a second job at times too. And that's that's the thing. Like I I wanted to push my volunteers to do more, but I know that they could quit at the in, at the drop of a hat. And mm -hmm. I it's a fine line to draw. And it just it's it was a lot tougher than I thought it was gonna be. Also, the very nature and sensitivity that you need to have with answer as well is is really tough as mm -hmm. well like not to say that i'm just a callous asshole who's like constantly making jokes about cancer or anything like that admittedly i do make jokes when i'm super uncomfortable yeah as well. yeah so Same. i use humor as a defense mechanism like get over it but mm -hmm. uh but you know like you gotta you gotta understand that some of the people that you work with are in very different situations. Some people have cancer mm -hmm. themselves. Some people have lost a lot of people to cancer. Yep. And like, oh, this is this is really tough, and I'm not sure I can stomach this. And so, am I imagining this correctly? Where you would call a this, let's say, company A, and say, "Hey, I'm calling from this nonprofit. You know, we would like some donation for this and this cause," and they would say. Oh, we would love to donate to this cause. However, we've already donated this this amount to cancer, this amount to AIDS, and this amount to this. Uh, you know, so yeah. our budget is now non-existent for your cause. So yep. have a nice day. That is, that is what happened a lot. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. but not only that, a lot of people were like, "Oh, yeah, we support cancer, but we just don't support your charity for cancer. Oh. We support we support the." The breast cancer oh, cancer yeah, uh, yeah. cancer place, the Susan G. Coleman place, or we support the local place, not the national or worldwide place yeah. that does cancer stuff. So there's competition there as well. Mm -hmm. Like, what the fuck? Like, which is kind why? of weird to say it's competition, is it? <laughs> it's it's true. It's true because you you don't think of nonprofit as a place where you're competing for dollars, but mm -hmm. yeah, there's absolutely, there's hundreds of charities out there that are doing great work for cancer. They're just doing it slightly differently. Yeah. And just imagine if all of them just got off their, got off their high horses and they all just united together. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't this just be so much easier just to go at things from a united front, but no, that's not the way that corporate America works.
at all. Yeah, I again from the little I know, the the only thing about that would be cancer is there's no cure for cancer because every cancer is different. Like, you know, yes. so like, you know, we go through yeah. I I once heard something and don't quote me on this. This might be total bullshit. <laughs> but one once I heard like your body, every single one of us goes through like different kind of like four cancers in our lifetime, but we like most of the time you you heal it yourself, right? And I'm not again, and I'm not saying you know that doesn't imply it doesn't exist or anything. No, no, no. I'm just saying, you know, there's a very a variety of different kind of cancers, right? And as you say, there is, you know, so some com- some companies are, you know, breast cancer. Some are like I don't know, testicular cancer. Some are you know this and this and this and so it's it's and it's, so because that's the most you know common argument is like well we've put so much money into curing cancer and there's no cure you know still so what what is the money for? And I'm like yeah. well it's not like you know it's not like it's the same like with cold like you know it's you know we get vaccinated or you know you can get have a vaccine you know for a flu vaccine right. But the flu vaccine every year changes based on what what flu is prevalent around the world. So there's different strains of flu and vice versa with cancer. So just, you know, breast cancer, you know, differs from this cancer and therefore it needs to be cured differently. But Mm -hmm. that's again, that's my limited knowledge of that topic. But it's kind of interesting to hear you talk about how there is a competition, even in a field where you'd imagine most people should be there for you know for the better purpose for like you know mm-hmm. the uh higher purpose you know very much like you know it is fascinating to me that's it's well it's so i can think of no better example mm-hmm. than from from gen v okay so there was there was a scene in gen v where they were trying to figure out the color that mm-hmm. they were going to have for a ribbon for somebody who had had been killed recently. Mm-hmm. They had to go through like so many different options because like, oh, light purple is for pediatric cancer or, you know, yellow is for breast cancer or whatever, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. no, don't, don't quote me on that. But they had to go with like a super specific shade of something that's like, oh yeah, this, this is nothing. Okay, mm-hmm. cool. Um, But to your point with cancer, the tricky thing with that is you're right. All of the different cancers require something different. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like, for example, with colorectal cancer, which is very much on the rise right now because people eat like shit mm-hmm. right now. And the screening for that was moved up from 50 to get your first colonoscopy to 45. Mm-hmm. And if you catch colorectal cancer early, it is very much pre- preventable. Mm-hmm. But something like pancreatic cancer is like a death sentence. Like you get pancreatic cancer and you're pretty much, you know, it's it's very tough to come back from that. Not to say that it you can't or you like nobody does, but, you know, it's it's hard. And then. The same thing with prostate cancer. Prostate cancer used to be a thing where people would pass away, mm. you know, pretty quick because it's really hard to detect prostate cancer. They've made a lot of advances yes. with that. And that is what this, this money is going towards is the slow but steady process to find treatment for yes. it. And like there's talk right now that there's vaccines starting mm-hmm. to be developed for for cancer. I think that's a great way to do that. But then the vaccine skeptics out there are going to get all pissy about that. And they're of just course. like, I don't know what I'm going to put in my body for that. Like, mm-hmm. I'm going to do my own research. And like, you, you think you can do your own research and, you know, trust your opinion for that? Like, yeah, I'm going to trust my mechanic because I don't know shit about cars. It's the yeah. same thing with vaccines. Like, I can't understand or make heads or tails of this research. Mm-hmm. So like when anybody ever says like, I do my own research, like, fuck you. Like mm-hmm. you, there's only so much research that you could do before you're going to get to a point where it's like, yeah, I don't get this. There's a reason why I didn't study 
medicine. Exactly. And it's and there's a difference between I'm just asking questions. Like, you know, because that's the most common argument. Oh, I'm just asking questions. I'm just asking questions. And there is a difference between, you know, being like, you know, this pedantic about, oh, well, nothing is really safe. And it's like, yeah, of course, nothing is really safe. Yeah, so there will be some side effects with some, you know, very small amount of people might experience some side effects, might experience this and this and this. Like, for example, I still remember here, I don't know if it was a big thing in the US, but when the first, one of the brands of COVID vaccines, uh, I cannot remember which one now, but they discovered fairly quickly that if you, uh, if you are, what was it, egg and lacto- lactose intolerant, I want to say. Oh. They, like, you know, they could give you, like, they didn't, you know, they didn't, nobody died, but they gave you some sort of shock. So oh. they quickly discovered that. And again, they quickly, you know, they actually asked me when I got that particular vaccine for COVID or against COVID, they quickly asked me, and it was like only a week later, uh, do you know of any allergy, especially, you know, are you lactose intolerant or do you, do you have, a, 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 you know, allergy to X? And I was like, no, as far as I know, no. And they were like, okay, all, all good. So they got, they get, they give me the vaccine and they were like, okay, can you please sit on this chair for 15 minutes? And then we can go, you know, if you feel fine, you can go home. If any, at any point you experience any, anything unusual, please raise your head, please let us know. Okay. And yeah, I've had all my shots. I've always been fine. And Yeah. I'm still waiting to be deactivated. <laughs> I'm still waiting to be there. I don't know if you've seen the tweets where everybody who has had this vaccine will, you know, this is the date where those people will die. And this mm-hmm. is like now, I think we are on our like sixth or seventh date. Yep. So yeah. it's just still, but yeah, it is kind of, it is kind of, again, as you, as you mentioned, I think I would try to <laughs> close this cancerous uh, chapter with, there is a progress being made. For example, like AIDS, you mentioned AIDS. Back in the 80s and 90s, I grew up in 90s. And I still remember this was a death sentence. That was a big thing when you were diagnosed with AIDS. You know, that was basically you were as good as dead. And now- Unless, unless you're mm-hmm. Magic Johnson. Who yes. Just, just, you know, and then good now, for him. Good, good exactly. for him. No, yeah. exactly. And now there are people- living their life and just yes you need to be on a what is it seven or like uh, quite a few pills every single day but you survive not only you survive you cannot transmit it to anybody else so you you can have healthy and fruitful sex life Mm -hmm. and you can exist as a normal human being you can live without you know having to having this like democles you know sword above your head and be like, yes, I'm gonna die, you know, next couple of months. Nowadays, right. it's no longer, and because it's it, you know, and because we've made progress, the same as do you remember the ice bucket challenge back in 2013? Yes, 14? yes, yes. ALS, yes. and people were mocking it even at the time. Like I was skeptical about how much money we're actually donating. And people didn't did not only donate, we there was a breakthrough with that. So it seems like we're on a very good track to have some sort of not necessarily a vaccine, but some sort of treatment where we would actually help people. Mm-hmm. So I, again, as you said, there's progress being made and there is, you know, people much smarter than people on the internet are actually mm-hmm. working on it. And actually they have the data, they have, you know, they know what they're doing. And, uh, you know, I do trust them. I do trust them. And I would strongly encourage, you know, people, yes, th- question stuff, fair enough. But, you know, mm-hmm. at some point you need to also acknowledge, am I a medically trained professional? If the answer is no, maybe your opinion doesn't matter as much. And not to mm-hmm. say there are some, unfortunately, there are some crazy medical professionals. I've heard of a few that they can spew some stuff as well. But yep. I, let's go to something lighter. So you mentioned you're okay. from suburb of Chicago, right? Mm-hmm. So... If I were to come for over for a week, not necessarily to stay with you, but to, you yeah. know, if I were to visit Chicago for a week, what would you say I need to see? What would you say I need to, oh, you need to try this food at this place because it's amazing. You know, let's say I have a week. Where would you send me in that week? It's, it's a tough call because 
I think Chicago is one of the most underrated cities in the U.S. because it does not have the glitz and glamour that L.A. or New York has, but it is significantly cleaner than than New York. It is the people are much nicer than both of those, and there is just something for everybody in in Chicago. So if you're a big sports fan. We've Mm -hmm. got all the all the sports teams that have decorated history with, you know, championships and things like that. So if you're a sports person, come to Chicago. If you like food, Chicago is known for some of the most interesting and crazy foods out there. Like Chicago style deep dish pizza is very divisive Mm -hmm. for people, but. It's it is my opinion and you know one of my quote unquote hot takes is that I hate New York style pizza because it's like eating paper. Okay. Like I hate it. But but then again also I get crap because I like Chicago style pizza and people are like so you like casserole with your your pizza. Like mm-hmm. yep. Yeah, okay, I I can get that. Um if you're somebody who likes architecture or likes a place that has a lot of rich history like With Chicago, there's, you know, everything with with Al Capone and, you know, Prohibition and things like that. There, We've got a rich history with, with that as well. I don't know if that's a selling point or not, but, like, you know. It is a part of a history, and, like, it is a fascinating history. It doesn't have to be, you know, all happy, you know. Al Capone right. was a fascinating person for all the, obviously, he wasn't a great person, but that doesn't make him any less interesting. The same... You know, there is a his, there is a museum dedicated to Hitler, and not to praise him by any means, just to showcase it's everything aware, he's been. Awareness, yeah, exactly. Awa- I know it's, it's about awareness. Yeah. Um, there's there's a lot of like museums, like one of like the the Art Institute of Chicago is world renowned for you know the art that's curated there. Got a lot of you know uh, our Shed Aquarium is really nice. Um. Grant Park, and uh, we've got a lot of really nice parks in the mm-hmm. area as well. Um, we got that damn bean. Can't forget about that damn bean. Um, What is that? Okay, tell me about it. So there, Chicago. One of the things that Chicago is known for is this giant. It's it's called it's it's actually in the shape of a cloud, but it's like a reflected. It, it's in the shape of a bean. Okay, unfortunately, so everybody calls it the bean. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just this like reflective bean in the middle of of a park that's that's all it is okay but people go ape shit for it because it's it's a really interesting structure and it's a great photo op you know i see so um so there's a lot of like touristy stuff like that um you know so chicago has a lot of different things for people um plus also The the tallest building in the U.S. It's not in the world anymore. The Sears Tower is here mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. as well. That's that's a cool structure and just there's something really daunting about being there and be and like being in the city and you're looking around and you just look up at this enormous building and you're like oh this is this is really cool. Plus there's also like a lot of tons of like concerts and festivals around the area. So like we've got the Taste of Chicago, which is this giant reason to just gorge on a shitload of food but then also you have like a music festival like Lollapalooza which okay. if you're into like punk or emo or alternative music um that's for you mm-hmm. well. so um so the big selling points for Chicago is that um don't come in the winter because it's miserable right now it's minus nine degrees Fahrenheit or minus like 15 degrees Celsius um that is just like a, a foot of snow And mm-hmm. the wind, you know, they don't call it the windy city for, for nothing. It it does get a lot colder because the wind does make a huge difference uh, mm-hmm. in the cold. So, yeah, Chicago, you know. Plus, also, there's lots of stuff in the surrounding suburbs. So, if you're looking like around where I live, there is a like a theme park, like nowhere near as good as like a a Disneyland or Universal, but. It's a Six Flags theme park, so it's branded with all like the DC uh, superhero stuff, and 
-hmm. Warner Brothers, like Looney Tunes characters like Bugs Bunny and all that stuff. So that's that's cool. That's a nice feather in the cap of where around where I live. Yeah. Um, you know, so plus a lot of the stuff in the surrounding suburbs, it's easy to get to by train as well. That's always a plus, you know, public transport. It's always a plus if you don't have to rent a car and if you can just get, you know, get like, you know, on a tram or a train. So that's always a good thing. I have Yeah. quickly Googled the Chicago Bean because I was like, I'm sure I must have, you know, seen it. And you know how I know about this. Have you seen the movie Source Code? Yes, I, I It have. is, it is, I didn't even know that's what it is, but it's obviously featured heavily in that movie. And I've always thought, oh, that's quite cool. And I didn't know, I, I don't think they say it's, I don't know, I've, it's been a long time since I've seen it. I'm not quite sure if they specifically say this is Chicago, but I was like, oh, that's, that, that is very fucking cool. No, so that's, Yeah. yeah. Well, and not only that, Chicago does have a rich history for movie building. And that's that's something that's really cool because there's a lot of tours for that as well. Mm -hmm. Plus, there's a ton of TV shows that take place in Chicago as well. So, um, but I know for me, um, like one of the one of the big things as well is that anytime that I watch The Dark Knight or Mm even Batman Begins, for that matter, I know. a lot of those locations because it's like, Oh, that's right by where I used to work when I sold it equipment. Like it's, it's cool because it was literally like in the same complex where, where I was in. And I was like, Oh, I recognize all that. That's not Gotham city. Yeah. Fucking liars. <laughs> no, it's always fun. Like I've never had that experience. We, we, uh, there was a the movie Tetris shot like actually where I live. So I still haven't seen it. So I, you know, I cannot say, oh, I recognize that building, but it's actually been shot here. <laughs> so I was like, that's kind of cool. Like I didn't didn't get to meet Adam, you know, you know the main guy, <laughs> but no, yeah, it's always fun to. Uh, For me, it's always fun to recognize. Hey, I used to be there, or you know, or I I went there because of this movie. For example, there is a movie Ferdinand about you know the animated movie about a bull. I don't know if you've seen it. Mm-hmm. I And have. there's this bridge. It's it's a cute movie. And there's this bridge, and my friend she was so obsessed with it. We when we all of us went to Spain, uh, me and my uh, my friends and I, we went to this town and we saw that bridge that is in the movie. quite heavy again prominently featured oh it, it was beautiful that was a it was a great holiday uh so what are your some favorite favorite places for you and to you know let's say you have a nice romantic time out or something for yourself like where would you like to you know grab a bite in chicago so, you know and what it would what would it be Uh, there is, there's, there's a place called Italian Village that I, I like to go because the ambiance of it is really good. Plus it's also across the street from, um, the, one of the theaters where they do like a lot of like Broadway shows. Okay. So, um, so for example, I, I know I, I've taken my wife to go see a Broadway show, Mm-hmm. but You know, if we ever wanted to get food beforehand, I would go go there. Plus, in Chicago, there's there's a lot of different places to eat. You know, you've got your typical like crap fast food, but there's also a lot of like places around the world. So, for example, there is there is like a coffee place that is like not like New Zealand theme, but it's got like a lot of New Zealand stuff in it. It's called Mojo, and my wife like we go down there every time because. Um, or we go there every time because it's close to the train station, but also it's, you know, it's just a nice way just to be reminded, Hey, this is, this is home as well. Um, a lot of the other restaurants and it's, it's tough because, um, if you watch the bear, the bear is right. That like, there's a lot of restaurants in the city Mm that are, that feature like prominent chefs that they're all closing because COVID wreaked havoc on the on the restaurant industry so it's really tough uh to to stay afloat when you have situations like that so the restaurant scene is changing but the nice thing is that it's constantly evolving and there's always something new to try which Yeah. i know i appreciate that every flavor that you could look for or could want whether you're looking for you know italian you know asian food 
Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Hispanic food, anything like that. There's, you've got a little bit of everything there. And Chicago is known for, for three, for three things, pizza, yep. hot dogs, mm -hmm. and Italian beef. Those are the three things in Chicago, which not exactly the culinary exploration that I'm sure people are, are looking for, but it's, it's all really good. And it's I mean, all delightful. you, you cannot, you know what they say, you cannot beat good Italian, you cannot beat good pizza. Like, you know, I don't think I ever had or tried proper, like a deep dish pizza. Like, I mean, I've, I've seen it. I know what it is. I would love to try it. Like, you know, I might not like it. I don't know, but I would love to try it. I'll, you know, I'm always in a boat where I'll always try something once, at least once when it comes to, especially when it comes to food, you know, so If I ever find myself in Chicago, like, you know, I'm not going to listen to the haters and I'll try it. I'll definitely try that. And it, that's a good attitude to have. Just try it, see what you think, Mm -hmm. and make the decision for yourself. You know, Again, like... yes. It's like, you know, you can get as many recommendations as you can, but you need to act upon it. You know, you need to then be brave enough to actually, try, you know, get out of your way and say, you know what, I'm not usually into this, but since I'm here, might as well just, you know, eat with the locals. You know, it's it's great, you know, uh, the places and the foods you might discover and you, you might discover, hey, I'm actually into this food, which I've never was before. So that's great. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So let's go through uh, this game called This or That. So it's quite easy. I'll give you two options and you tell me which one would you rather go for. And it goes from silly to something sometimes even deep. So let's try and see what we come up with. So Mike, are you more of a big party guy or a small gathering? Small gathering. Mm -hmm. And I would even go so far as I also very much need my alone time. Like Fair I, enough. I value my my alone time and it's tough when you have a family mm -hmm. it, it can be tough sometimes to have have alone time um but i'm much more of a hey let's let's get together with a small group of friends as opposed to going to a giant party and i know that my kids are the same way or particularly my daughter because mm -hmm. we went we've gone to two data daughter dances and mm -hmm. the first one was like a smaller thing and the second one was like this giant one where like dads were bringing their kids in limos and bleh. but Yeah. she she was she was very overwhelmed by that i get overwhelmed in giant crowds too Mm -hmm. so yeah i i would say much more of a small gathering person I think I'm right there with you. Like I and I've been noticing more and more people. It's almost like this generational shift where it used to be people would go out and party, or it seems from the movies and TV shows I consume. You know, there was it used to be this big party, you know, thing. And now more people are like, you know what? I'm good. I'll stay home. I'll Well, just, you know, read a book. well, I think also people are starting to realize that, you know, it's not just the people around you. There's so many other people out there in the world and don't necessarily need to go out to party or anything like that. Plus, it's really, it's really toxic to go out all the time Mm. where, you know, it's just people out there are just. disgusting and gross and things like that and just the way that they treat people is is Mm -hmm. kind of terrible as well so i don't miss the day like my wife and i were talking about this recently where we both were asking each other do you miss going out and partying a lot and both of us were like no i'm good i'm good Yeah. that was for a very specific part of my life but Mm now -hmm. i'm i'm good and now nowadays yeah like a lot of the Because I work with high school students at my church and a lot of them are like, yeah, I don't like to go out and Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just like to just hang out and chill with friends. No, honestly, I'm in the same boat. Like, like I don't mind going out. Like, I, I, I'm, I don't think I'm anxious person per se, but I definitely appreciate my peace, my quiet time, or just you know, doing whatever fuck I want. Really, that's Yeah. just the freedom. Mm. Well, and that's that's something for me. I do have anxiety. So yeah, like stuff like that stresses me out. So No, that's fair. That's that's fair. And again, you know, you at least you can find what you, works for you. You know, Yep. It's true. so now 
iOS or Android as an ex IT person? iOS with without a doubt. Ooh, Um, really? so it, here here's the reason why because I used to have a a cell phone service that did not have the iPhone at Okay. first because in the U because I'm pretty sure everywhere else around the world and you could use the iPhone on whatever service you wanted. But in the U.S., of course, there was an exclusivity about that. So you needed to have AT&T service with that. And no, I am not, as much as I want the iPhone, I am not going to AT&T service. Okay. So I had Verizon phone service. And because of that, I had to have the choice between the BlackBerry and the Android phone, phone system. And Android was billed as, hey... All the things about the iPhone you love, but, you know, in different flavors and different customizations. Mm -hmm. Um, I found out pretty quick that a lot of the things, the appeals that I, that there are for Android, I just didn't care about. So Yeah. I don't need my phone to be an extension of my fucking personality. Mm I just need it to do the functions that I need it to do. -hmm. So I don't need to like download all these widgets. I don't Mm need -hmm. Yeah. it to have like different things like that. I just need my phone to work. Mm -hmm. And any time that I switched from like a Motorola phone to a Samsung phone or to an HTC phone, it's all different. You have to like kind of relearn it. And that frustrated me. Whereas if you've got an iPhone, you pretty much know how most iOS devices work. Yes. And It syncs up very nicely with all the stuff. I'm a brand snob in that sense. And yes, for all those people who are like, you're a sheep. Like, yes, I am a very much a sheep for, Mm for Apple stuff. So I I would say iOS for that. How -hmm. how Mm -hmm. that's about fine. you? Look, look, I'm not trying to be Switzerland, but you know, this is one of those topics I'm I've learned to like, you know. I'm not really passionate either way. I've used now Android for a couple of years because of the customizations and because of the, like, you know, the freedom it gives you in a sense where if I want this specific notification off, I can do that on iPhone and it's still not possible or even even change the, I think maybe now there's the, the with the iOS 15, I think maybe now you can actually change the tones of notifications for like your messages and for different notifications. But I don't know. But in, on Android, that's been the case ever since. So for me, it's all more about the customization, you know, where if I hear this beep, I know this is this app. So probably this person is messaging me. Whereas if I hear that beep, then I know I don't have to respond to it because it's this app. Uh, but my girlfriend is the exact opposite. She is exactly like you. She has all the iOS. So she's got iPhone. She's got iPad. She's got a uh, macbook she's got uh apple you know their airphone the you know the phone um uh, the yeah AirPods listening devices the Air, AirPods. airpods thank you <laughs> i was like listening to the airpods so she is in your boat so i've you know through you know through her i could see if you have all these apple devices all these ios devices their you know system that you know that structure and that how everything syncs within each other it is next to flawless as long as it works you know if it works fine is next to flawless it is easy to set up it is easy to use so like now i like nowadays i really cannot blame people if you know like you you know as you said i just want something to you know that works and i know how to work it and yeah i that's what made iphone the giant it is now They gave some, you know, people something that worked, something that was easy to, you know, easy to work and something they ever since then has not really changed for better or for worse. So now, no, yeah, I, I get it. I, especially if you have MacBook as well or iPad, it's, you know, the sync between those is fascinating. I'll say like when she showed me the other day where she copied her credit card details from her phone. And it went straight to her iPad with just one touch of a button. I was like, damn, that's fucking cool. All right, I'll give you that. Like, that's, you know, excellent. Pretty nice. It's pretty nice. Yeah. Yeah. So for you, I, I think this is maybe a bit obvious, but let's ask the anyway, TV shows or movies?
This is a tough call because lately it's been TV shows. Historically, it's been movies. So, Mm -hmm. like, I'm I'm not gonna pull a like oh both or anything like that. But right now, in this particular moment in my life, it's TV shows. And there's there's a couple of reasons for that. One is because I subscribe to all of these different um, streaming platforms, Mm -hmm. so might as well get my money's worth uh, with that and watch all these TV shows. Plus, also. I feel like last year was, there was a lot of really great TV Mm -hmm. last year. Um, A lot of like legacy shows that were ending, but a lot of like decent shows that are like starting to ramp up. Yep. And I feel like, dare I say, maybe TV maybe had a slightly better year than movies last year. I don't think that's controversial. I feel like, it's over past, you know, almost 10 years, I would imagine even more. Like, you know, the TV, you know, is, you know, has changed and the TV shows what we would used to watch, you know, as a movie now has shifted to TV. And that's why, you know, things like Breaking Bad, if you go slightly back, but or now I still haven't seen it, but I, I've been oh. hearing Succession is awesome. Yes. The bear. I still haven't seen the bear. I, it's on my queue. But as as you as you know, the ever growing queue of two hundred plus TV shows to watch and thousand plus movies to watch. Well, and that's that's also the big problem. And this is something that I talk to about people all the time. Is that when you watch movies, mm-hmm. the nice thing about that is that unless it's a series or a franchise or anything like that, that's it. Yes, you do like solid like. Two, two and a half hour movies, I, depending on what kind of flavor you like for a movie. It could be mm-hmm. three, four, five, six hours, you know, depending on what you like. With TV shows, it's a much bigger investment yes. with that. So, for example, here's a good example. So, the I just finished the TED mm-hmm. mini se- or like event series on, on Peacock not mm-hmm. too long ago. That was... so. The, those movies, they're about like hour and a half, two hours long. Yep. So both of them. But the series by itself is like solid like three, four hours mm-hmm. of of content that I got to watch. Mm-hmm. And that's just a lot of time that you got to invest in that, which is why anybody who says is like, yeah, I keep up with all things TV. It's like, no, you don't. Like mm-hmm. it is impossible to keep up with. Like, it's already impossible for movies, but it's even more impossible with TV because guess what? We have to do things like socialize, sleep, Mm -hmm. eat, Mm -hmm. like all that other shit. So it's so hard to keep up with all that stuff, which is why everybody's cues for for TV shows and movies will never get completely clear. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. Exactly. I always talk to people like, you know, in my work because they, they, you know, I'm the movie guy for many people. So I always say, even if I had, a, let's say, a year long holiday where I didn't have to do anything, they didn't have to do any work, but just watch movies and TV shows, you know, and let's say I would be proper shut in and where I would do nothing for the entire year, which obviously would be mental and I would never do that. But mm-hmm. let's say in this specific scenario where, where you could watch easily, let's say five, six movies a day and do nothing, nothing else and go to sleep and and next day, you know. You would still not be nowhere near catch up. You know, even after a year, you can watch like 1,500 something movies. And I guarantee you, at the end of that year, my queue would be different. It would not be the same. It would just be different movies because I would watch all of these and there would be new ones popping up, right? Or the or the streaming services I subscribe to would have a new additions where oh, I didn't see this one from 1972. I didn't see this movie from 1996. I heard a lot lot of good stuff about. And that's the thing, isn't it? You know, us. So I've always, you know, I've always had this big dream of trying to watch every single movie ever made, which I know it's impossible. (laughs) But, you know, like... Not Not with that attitude. Exactly. Men can dream. But, and I was, and I, you know, and I had a discussion with my mate about it once, once upon a time. And he, you know, I was like, you know, see, that's that's what pisses me off. Is like, no matter if, even if I live, let's say, two hundred, which is unlikely, but you know, there's a chance, I would still not, you know, manage to see every single thing I would want to see, 
because there's so much. And he then responded. He said, well, think about it the other way around. You will never run out. So tea or coffee? Coffee, without a doubt. Coffee, because, I mean, growing up in the U.S., I've never had a reason to drink tea. And the only mm. reason why I have drunk tea recently is because my wife occasionally likes tea because she's very anti-coffee and we make tea for my daughter when she's not feeling great so it, it, but coffee 100 percent, because you know there's a reason why there's like a starbucks around every corner in the u.s but mm -hmm. there's no like dedicated tea place only there's so many different options for coffee mm -hmm. and tea is just like in the background so yeah same I, for me same for me coffee all the way I have my coffee set up. I have I I get my specialty coffee beans from this nice place in Edinburgh mm. or Edinburgh, like as mm. people like to pronounce it properly. Nice. Uh, and no, yeah, but like I'm kind of like your daughter. I only drink tea when I'm sick. Yeah, yeah. So, and... but my girlfriend she loves tea, so she's more a tea person than I am. Which yeah. So what? Okay, give me give me your typical coffee order then. What do you typically like well, do you do you kind of vary it up a little bit kind of based on the situation or do you really have like a go-to? For me it's more about if I'm so the way I lost my weight is through intermittent fasting, which is something I'm still doing. So for me it's more about am I fasting or do I want to break my fast? Because here is the thing. If you do it, you I this is how I learned to drink just black coffee. Because that's the really, if you're fasting, you can only, you know, drink water, black tea or black coffee, right? So this is how I learned to drink black coffee. And so for me, the question is, do I want to break my fast or do I just want to have Americano? Or, you mm -hmm. know, you would call it, I guess, long black. Mm -hmm. uh, we call it Americano. <laughs> and or filter coffee because we go to this nice place and they do have a filter as well so they have like a fancy beans with filter and it's a nice coffee and at home i usually do like a there is a coffee method called v60 i believe it's originated from japan japan so mm -hmm. i've learned how to do that and that's what i usually do for my work because that that way i can get like a half a liter of coffee and okay. this is my like one big dose of coffee through like throughout the day okay so, but yeah so for me like uh, you know but if i were to go out and if i wanted to break my fast usually i'm boring i would get like a i love i love me some oat milk i don't drink normal milk so i i like oat milk so oat latte oat flat white cappuccino those kind of normal things nothing mm. too fancy to be honest but again i don't take any sugar or anything like that just milk and coffee got it okay so money or free time? This, this is this is a tough call as well because um, you need money for everything, but you can replenish money. You can't replenish your free time mm -hmm. to some extent or another. So I'm going to go with free time knowing that I'm like hundreds of thousand dollars in debt because of my student loans and credit cards and mortgage and everything like that. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go with, with free time kind of based on the conversation that we had earlier about big party or small gathering. I'm, I'm much more value my, my time and everything like that. And, you know, sometimes just chilling out just matters a lot yeah. to me as opposed to like filling my day with errands and activities and such. No, same. And I always view it in a way that the rich, you know, the, you know, the richest of us, that's why they have multiple assistants. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if you think about it, they, the only thing they cannot properly buy is time. So that's why they have assistant for everything. So they don't have to do their laundry, do their shopping, do this and this and this. And, you know, if you don't understand why you can laugh about it, you can be like, oh, they are so incompetent. No. <laughs> No, like I would if if I had if I had this kind of money, I would probably do the same because that's the only proper time or proper way how to buy time, quote unquote. Right. And you know, it's because that's kind of yeah, that's the only way you cannot really cheat is time. 
-hmm. So this is the closest you we can probably get to that, I guess. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah, no, I'm on the same way, like same as you. So here is the maybe a bit controversial honesty or others feelings. Others feelings. This isn't controversial for oh, okay. me. So okay. I'm I'm very much I I will very much bury what I have to say about something in favor of someone else's feelings, much to, probably to my detriment as well. Mm -hmm. I fully admit that. And I know that's something that my wife and I have had like points of contention on uh, mm -hmm. in the past about, you know, like it sounds weird to say being considerate of other people's feelings, mm -hmm. but that comes at the expense of your own feelings mm -hmm. at times. But that's, that's just who I am as a person that I'm, I'm considerate of other people's feelings, but not to a sense where I feel like I'm lying to them, yeah. where I, I try to find a way to spin it so that I'm not completely crushing somebody's hopes. That kind of, to me, it's weird to say this, that it surprises me, but it kind of does, because I, I know the little I'm, I've known you, you're a quite straight shooting person. So I, I, I am. Yeah, I, I do that. But also it's, Which is weird because also the nature of what we talk about when it comes to movies yeah. does require a bit of a level of honesty and objectiveness mm -hmm. that I some people just can't do mm -hmm. as well. Like, have you ever gotten flack for writing something about something that somebody didn't agree with? Actually, once... Like, yeah. you know, I've, I've written quite a few things, but only once. And it was just like somebody actually took a screenshot and I underlined one sentence. And I was like, I, yeah, I guess I could have explained it better. So what I've done, I killed them with kindness. I was like, yeah, no, you're actually, uh, you know, instead of arguing with them, I was like, actually, you're 100% right. I should have, I should have said this. You're 100% right. Thank you for that. And yeah. I don't think they expected me to be like, you know, to be like, Oh yeah, I, I acknowledge that I fucked up, and you know, and they were like, "Okay, yeah," and it's 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 tough, but like, also like for me, for somebody who's in training as mm -hmm. well, I do have to be very direct yeah. with people because yeah. if you're not, and you have to, I guess I, it's it's weird because I have to do both mm -hmm. at times, but there's a lot of instances where I, I do try to be considerate with other people's feelings. And that's that's to say, like, hey, being honesty means you're just like an asshole and you're just mm -hmm. telling people, like, the truth and everything like that. No, that's not that's no. not what that means. But I and that's also just the way I was raised as mm -hmm. well, is to try to, try to think of... I don't want to say be considerate because that's that's not the nature of this, but... I'm also very much, it's not what you say, it's how you say it as well. And softening a little bit what you have to say sometimes does help and it does matter. But there are some people that you could just be completely direct with because it depends. Yeah. Like it sucks to say, but it does depend from person to person. Some people respond to being direct and some people don't. Mm -hmm. See, it's kind of funny because I actually would say honesty. But mm -hmm. I actually would say everything what you just said because I've that's one thing I've learned as me being a very honest person. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to again, you need to pick your bot battles first, and second, you need to understand where this person is coming from and how to ward yourself so there is no unnecessary fight or there is no unnecessary like you know problem. Especially like you know if you're at work. And there's a power that dynamic, you know, there's obviously you don't want to be more of an asshole than you need to to somebody, especially if you're in the position of power, you know, then you should definitely not do that. Yeah. Uh, in the relationship, yeah, my girlfriend calls me European Lucas because <laughs> I sometimes just don't mince my words because I would much rather just have it out in the open and then we can talk about it, you know. And yeah, but again, like it's as you say, there is levels to what I'm going to say. There's levels mm. to how I'm going to phrase myself. So I'm never going to be full on like, oh, I don't care what do you, what do you, you know, what do you feel? I'm just going to say this. I, you, you know, I've learned my lessons over my, <laughs> my life. So yeah, I'm less argumentative than I used to be. I'll say that. Mm -hmm. nice. So 
summer or winter? Summer. This isn't even a question. It's summer. Same. But but here's here's the caveat that I will I will say. Okay. And I know that this is physically impossible, but just Mm. hear me out on this. I love the snow. I love it a lot because it is beautiful and I love playing in the snow. You know what I don't like though? The cold. Yes. I hate the feeling of being cold. Mm -hmm. So if I can have a situation where I can play in the snow, but it's still like sunny and I could do it in shorts, that would be paradise for Mm -hmm. me. And I get it. You're giving me that look like you're, 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 kind of an idiot but okay but i that would be a perfect situation for me uh Mm -hmm. because i there's something about the summer where i love being outside and i love you know just getting out and just being social with people um and the winter you know like i i I like wearing jeans and such so that's kind of nice but also it just sucks because you can't do much in the winter because it's freezing outside. Mm-hmm. Like I'm, I'm really debating, like, do I really like, how bad do I really want to go outside today when it's now minus, Oh, it's minus eight degrees Fahrenheit <laughs> right now. Oh, thank God. Thank yeah. you. No, like I'm, I'm a hundred percent there as well. Summer all the way. Like I was born in the summer and I love summers. Like I don't necessarily hate winter. I, I, Kind of like snow. I'm not. I don't know if I'm in your boat and loving it. I like snow, but you know, I've shuffled through one too many driveways to just you know do did my like chores in the snow as a kid. Yeah. Where I'm like, ah, oh, let's just not do that. This is just you know. We we had to shovel our driveway four times mm. uh, to make sure to get all the snow out this past yeah. weekend. It was, it was it sucked. It sucked a lot, but you know, comes with the territory, I guess. Thoughts and prayers. Thoughts and prayers. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So, ninjas or pirates? I read this and I was like, this, this is an interesting question. Uh, I'm I'm going to go ninjas because mm-hmm. um, with, with ninjas, there is something very sneaky and mysterious mm-hmm. about them that I really like. And since I'm a small gathering person who doesn't really like to be all flashy and things like that i kind of like just being in the background Mm -hmm. and i feel like there is a level of piracy where you have to be upfront and boisterous and kind of like a peacock that i just can't get on board with so okay so that's your ideal like adventure just you know your small gathering of ninjas and you just you know chill and hide in the shadows yeah just attack people that's no that's cool yeah i I get the appeal of being a pirate also because I guess sure there could be ninjas of the sea and everything mm-hmm. like that, but I, I like being on land. I'm not much of a person who likes being on the open seas. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's the thing you, that's why it's there. Like you can take this any way you want. If you, you know, if it's how much fun you would have, or if it's what you would you prefer to watch, you know, like that's why, that's why it's there. So now let's get philosophical a bit. Free will or destiny? Free will. I'm somebody who I struggle with phrases like everything happens for a reason or something mm-hmm. was meant to be mm-hmm. or anything like that. I really struggle with that a lot because if that was the case, then what was what's the point of doing all this if you know like I get it, journey journey's part of the the destination, yes. you know how you get there matters a lot Mm -hmm. and things like that. But there's something about me having a little bit of control of my life that I want to have. Mm -hmm. And I struggle a lot when someone says like, Oh yeah, this was, this is how it's supposed to be. Like says, says who? (laughs) Um, And I get it. The, the religion, the religion aspect of that, like oh god's will and all that stuff and you know i believe in god ish Mm -hmm. i guess but it's also one of those things where i'm not going to i'm not going to let that dictate everything in my life so so free will 100 percent. i was gonna say because you mentioned church a couple of times so i'm like how does this mesh where with you know religion this kind of idea of free will because 
I would like you know devil's advocate here like uh, like it almost feels like like it goes the other way for most religions because most religions there's a like a there's a path where you mm. follow this path you do this you do this you do this therefore almost removing you removing your free will if you want from the yeah. equation where you are part of this you know christianity or buddhism or islam or this and this and this and then you follow this group where there is no need for free will there's no need for your ego for your identity so it almost seems contrary you know to me but you know that's what makes it fascinating i guess i'm practicing what i preach then mm -hmm. at that point mm -hmm. that i have the free will to think for myself in certain yep. aspects i'll take all i'll take all of that into consideration but at mm -hmm. the same time i got to do what's best for me and my family and all that stuff yeah. and you know i i think of religion as like and just what i learn in church mm -hmm. as more of a a guide as opposed to a blueprint yeah so okay all right that's that's fair that's fair i'm 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 same free will except i don't really go to church i'm an atheist as they as 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 atheist as they come so but it's nothing unusual from where i'm where i'm from <laughs> uh and the last question would be time travel twice or teleport infinite times so by teleport i can just teleport to anywhere yep. like within one timeline or I could travel to any timeline. Okay. I think we leave timeline timelines. You know, we don't know for certain there are timelines. So I would just, you know, read it. Right, because time because time because time travel is, you know, just a exactly. solid thing, uh, for sure. This this is a tough call, but I think I'm gonna go tele teleport infinite times because I would be too afraid of messing something up from a time travel of standpoint. butterfly effect. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's um, I've seen too many movies to mm -hmm. get nervous about stuff like that. Yeah, and I don't want to accidentally write myself out of existence because I stepped on the wrong bug. Yeah, or something like that. Yeah. Um, you know, teleporting. One of my favorite superheroes is Nightcrawler from the X Men. So teleporting, mm -hmm. it, you know, really appeals to me. Plus, also, that would just cut down on my commute as well. That is true. That is true. So, um, so yeah, tele I, I would say teleporting infinite times because if I can only time travel twice, does that twice imply travel there and back? Or is it two round trips? Look, you can, you know, interpret it any way you want. So I'm going to interpret it as that it is just one singular round trip, whereas, you know, I'm all about value in mm -hmm. this sense. And infinite times... Yeah, I will I will do that. But you know what's the most common answer for this? You know, being like especially now in the age where we live in now, it's like, well, I would take time traveling once, you know, here and back, because I could go back to 2007 and tell to my, you know, back then I would be 15, 16, and tell that you know, to that small person, you know what? There's this thing called Bitcoin. Yeah. You know, buy like thousands of them as you know as much as you can and wait and just you wait and don't don't lose it wait bye so here's here's the struggle that i have with with mm -hmm. situations like that mm -hmm. because if it, i feel like everything that i've done has led me to the life that yes. i have now yeah and i very much like the life that i have now is mm -hmm. it perfect no Mm -hmm. I'm I'm an anxious mess, riddled with debt, mm -hmm. morbidly obese, according to my doctor. And you know, no, my life's not perfect, but my I don't think I would trade my family for anything. Mm -hmm. And it's different, like it is different when you have kids and yes. everything like that. Like I hate to admit it, but it just is. And mm -hmm. to be in that situation where I could potentially mess that up with time travel and that would lead me to this different timeline where i would not have these kids mm -hmm. scares the shit out of me so no i don't think i don't think there would be anything that i would do differently mm -hmm. like i i feel like also like hey if i was 
if I was like skinnier or something like that, I don't, I don't think I'd have the life that I have now. So. Mm -hmm. No, I understand. Look, again, there's no right or wrong answer to this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah I, this, I understand this is, that. This is but... the thing. And like, you know, and now I feel like, you know, you can, you, you know, I, I can tell much more about you than I could, you know, an hour before. So this is awesome. Like, honestly. Yeah. But all right, last part before we move into the movie part of this podcast is time to get canceled. <laughs> Yeah. And you can you can take this again any way you want. We can have an honest debate about many uncomfortable topics. It's up to you. So give me your hottest take or two, and we can discuss whatever you want. Up to you. I I've been I've been racking my brain a lot about this because when we first talked about this, mm -hmm. you wanted to include this. I did get like we did have a little bit of a talk yes. about it. How like. I I sometimes struggle to separate artists from art yep. and how like there are some people that yeah like R. Kelly despite mm -hmm. the fact that I love some of his songs like mm -hmm. I can't listen to him anymore mm -hmm. same thing with Kanye West I can't do it anymore yep. but you have somebody like Chris Brown who has been a serial and repeat person who who has beaten women and objectified them um i still love his music mm -hmm. and i still I, you know i still love michael jackson's music despite the fact that all the evidence points to yeah you probably did something with some of these kids but mm -hmm. i still love his music and it sucks that i'm very selective in that sense and there's certain levels to it as well like mm -hmm. i don't know it just it's that it kind sucks. of duality of man, isn't it? It's that yeah. kind of like we, I feel like we live in this age where we are more aware than ever before of, hey, these people who make art, who make movies or music or, you know, back in the day it would be paintings and it would be like sculptures all all that. Back then they didn't know about them. So they can just admire the art. Nowadays yeah. in 2024, which it's insane. It's 2024. I know. Uh, we know much more than ever about the people who make the art for us. So we, I feel like there's a, like, we, we all struggle with this where we would all want to support just the best people, just the people we know, or we perceive to know, we wish to know. And they, you know, and they're like, I support this person because this is the greatest person that's ever been. I've seen many interviews with, with them. You know, I listened to, you know, to him talk about this and this and this issue and this, and he's always all spot on. And then a year later or two years or five years later, something comes out that this person is not that great. And then we need to reconcile that. Like, I feel like, like, for example, Kevin Spacey, right? I find myself just, yeah, it's been weird. It's weird how, first of all, all the people or all the young men who had some 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 something to say about him have died. That is weird. That that's, is very that's weird. a bit that's a bit problematic. It's it kind of reminds me as like you know certain Russian uh, you know politician <clears throat> Putin had you know had the fortune of every single journalist that dared to question him happen to commit suicide or happen to jump out of window or be poisoned family, or multiple family, times you know. poisoned yeah yep yeah so you know for so to me you know but back to kevin spacey it's it you know for me it was like and i now hear takes i was like well he was always a bad actor and this is where i kind of draw the line for me is like look we know no, separate no. Yeah, that's the thing. Like no, you know, we need no, to separate. No, he wasn't. He was. He was a fantastic actor. Exactly. Fantastic. He, he's been like you know, like he. You can argue him and David Fincher made Netflix the the giant it is today, because mm -hmm. they you know House of Cards legitimized that domain, legitimized that streaming service. Because before that, it was just, hey, this is a cool you know replacement of Blockbuster, and now yep. oh they they can actually produce good shit. That's that's fucking cool. Yep. And here's the thing, like, you know, and two things, and I think this is what we've lost a bit. Two things can, can be true at the same time. 
you know, I can say I do not support what Kevin Spacey's allegedly done because again, nothing's been proven because surprisingly or unsurprisingly, many people have turned out dead, which and then yeah, I'm I not 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 quite sure how I feel about that. Well, I feel really weird about that. But mm-hmm. nothing's been proven. He wants to come yeah. back. And it is weird. Like I'm, I'm you know, like am I looking forward to next Kevin Spacey movie? Not necessarily. But mm-hmm. and here's the thing. We need to be adult enough to say, despite all of that, would you know can I watch him in the usual suspect and still think he's he was a phenomenal actor or in American Beauty or in Road to Perdition or all those movies? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like I can. Like, you know, it yes, is it slightly harder knowing that? Is it slightly harder knowing that that person is unfortunately been a bit quote unquote creepy? Mm-hmm. It is no, it is hard. And the same for the music, you know, as you said, like I never I never listened to Kanye or Chris Brown or R. Kelly. Like mm. I know some of their big songs. So for you know just for me, I never felt really any other way. But mm-hmm. you know, if we are into movies, which we are into movies, we don't you know, there's a lot of people that just the other day, I don't know if you've seen this article, Mia Goff Pearl herself has been accused of uh, and again. At this moment, accusation the alleged, allegedly, allegedly that's the so, that's the key thing. Yes, yes, yes. But it's been alleged that she kicked a background actor or something like that. In the, like kicked him in the head and yes. then and then kind of was gloating about yep. it afterwards, saying how you know what are you gonna do about it? You and know? again, so it's important to note it's alleged, like nothing's been proven or disproven. So mm-hmm. we can and again. And of course, what's happened, some people were like stepped out of the woodworks and were like, well, that's because she's a woman. I'm like, wait, what? What the fuck? And suddenly, yeah, like, is, you know, there's this, is... there's this like chauvinistic behavior suddenly, all of a sudden, like people are expecting it. And I'm like, what? Why? Because what she is, plays. What does that have to do because with she... anything? Yeah. Because she plays. Because no, because I've seen some comments like, well, that's why she plays psychopath so well. I'm like, Okay, it's a f- kind of funny joke, but it's not really no. <laughs> yeah. Like, so yeah, to me, no, yeah, grasping so, at straws at that point. Yeah. Exactly. You know. So to me, like again, like we should, and I think now we should take you know accusations seriously, but also, as far as we know, and it, I think this is the big point. No matter how many interviews you watch or you know hear f- with your favorite artist, that you, you don't know them. Mm-hmm. you know i would love to know like i would love to for example believe like i don't know keanu reeves one of those he by all accounts he seems to be the most wholesomest like the wholesomest person you ever meet and i would love to believe i, I know that for sure do i i don't and neither no. do you unless you actually know him no you know? no i've the closest i've gotten to a keanu reeves thing is that i one of my uh one of my buddies worked at a at a movie theater and heard a story that, you know, some guy came into a movie theater with his motorcycle helmet on. And, Mm -hmm. you know, as soon as the lights turned out, the movie started, it took his helmet off and it was Keanu Reeves. And it was super cool. All right. Like, cool. Okay. That's, that's interesting. And, but yeah, like it kind of breaks your heart when there's a situation where it's like, Oh, I, they got you. Okay. You're, Kind of you're kind of an asshole mm. and i i have a lot of trouble reconciling that because look at the end of the day i'm not perfect mm-hmm. i've grown and evolved because i was an idiot when i was a kid and mm-hmm. like i'm i'm an idiot now i make i make mistakes and i think how you come back from those certain certain situations really defines who you are as a person and if you keep doing those mistakes so like it's it's the struggle. Like I think Chris Brown, unfortunately for me is the biggest example of that because he's had multiple instances. Obviously the Rihanna situation is the biggest instance, but I like, I feel like also I listened to more of his music before all of that stuff happened. Mm -hmm. And like his current stuff, like I don't listen to it, Yeah, but like, I don't know. It just, it sucks because it's like, 
I like how is it I can listen to Chris Brown's music, but like I do I have an issue with with listening to like R. Kelly's music, which is just as like catchy and things like that. Um I guess it's because R. Kelly has been like actually prosecuted for all this stuff, whereas Chris Brown really hasn't had that much accountability for Mm that, Mm-hmm. which then makes me an asshole because it's like, oh, like you're selectively looking at some of the some of the situations and legislating them differently. It's like, well, Yeah. But yeah, again, there's I mean. something like your personal taste. You know, at the end of the day, it's also about what you enjoy. And again, let's separate the art from the artist. You know, let's say they are all crystal clean, bunch of angels. You know, it's also what you enjoy. You know, it's more... Uh, you know, to me, it reads more about you, you know, you prefer somebody like Chris Brown and his take on music, what he does rather than R. Kelly. Again, so I, f I feel like that could be that angle as well. And at the end of the day, that's also, you know, we all have our biases when it comes to movies, when it comes to certain certain studios, certain actors, certain musicians. So, yeah, like when when stuff like that happens... It's much easier for us. I think those biases can come through where if we didn't like somebody for whatever reason and that somebody turns out to be abuser or or some sort of bad person, it's much easier for me to say like, oh, yes, I've always known there was something wrong about them. No, I didn't. It's just, you know, I didn't really like them. That's that's it. Like, that doesn't mean I knew anything extra than you would know. You know, Yeah. it's just... And those are the biases we all have. No. I mean, it, it is what it is at that Exactly. point. There's like, I, I, I like that approach. Like, we shouldn't be running away from some of our biases, especially when it comes to that, but we have to reconcile it to some extent or another. I have to be able to answer for it. Mm hmm There's, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, It is who we are, and we just need to Mm hmm we just need to be able to reconcile that, like I said Yes, before. correct. Any more hot takes or do you want to move to the movie part of the podcast? Let's move to the movie part of it. I feel like I gave some of my hot takes already about how like corrupt the nonprofit industry is and how um Mm -hmm. you know Yeah. how I love iOS versus Android. So I, I'm, I'm feeling very vulnerable right now. So Yeah, that's you're definitely going to be cancelled 10 times over after this is aired. <laughs> a absolutely. And So me alongside you. there we go. At least I'll be, a I, at least I won't be alone. Yeah, exactly. I'm always there. <laughs> so now let's talk movies. And again, this will be much broader discussion about movies in general. So let me ask you, Mike, what was the last new movie you would rate 5 out of 5 or 10 out of 10? And just to clarify, new movie, anything past 2020. So the last movie that I rated five out of five stars was Past Lives. And Oh, yes. uh, I, I went into this movie assuming that this was not going to be as good as I was hoping that it would be. Because I, I do find that there are some movies out there that um, when they're overhyped, I tend to not like them Mm -hmm. as much. Um I like the last movie that I was worried about that I like, thankfully I like got on the hype train with that. Like, I feel like everybody loved everything everywhere all at once a lot more than I thought people were going to. So when I saw it, I was like, there's no way that this is this good. Mm -hmm. And then when I came out of it, I was like, holy shit. Yeah, it is that good. Mm -hmm. Yep. But with past lives, I was expecting this to be like, an interesting story about two people whose whose lives like little decisions in their lives go in different directions and as much as you want to be the person that you were before and that situation that you wanted before you can't you can't go back to that and there's nothing wrong with that i was not expecting to have this like philosophical thoughts in my head about like It's almost kind of like these sliding doors moments, but at Mm -hmm. the same time, it's we need to be okay and reconcile the person that we were and the person that we are now. And there's, you know, we're different.
And there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. And as much as you want to go back to that person that you were before, you're not, you're not that person anymore. And that's, that's okay. Like that conversation that they had at the, the two main characters had at the bar yep. uh, with four third wheel husband uh, <laughs> yeah. there just, um, I was very moved by mm -hmm. that, by that discussion. And it's one of my favorite moments in a movie, like of the last, like at easily this decade, but like in a mm -hmm. long time, because I think those discussions, you know, we're so catered and or we're so groomed to think like some of the best moments in movies are the ones that offer the biggest spectacle. Yeah. But for me, sometimes the best moments in movies are the ones that make me think the most. Mm -hmm. And like, I know for me, my favorite moment of everything everywhere all at once is the, the time or the, the dimension with the rocks where they're rocks. Oh yeah. Like I, I was very moved by that. Same. Dare I say, I'll admit it. I cried a little bit during that part. And same thing in this past slide, like that, that conversation they had at the bar, mm -hmm. um, just moved me to tears so much. So to the point where when they're walking to this Uber mm -hmm. at the end, I'm like, what the fuck is going to happen? Yep. Like, I, I don't, I don't know. And then when she walks away and she's just devastated, it's like, oh. And you know she hasn't cried for a while because she says that the last time I've cried was in Korea, I believe. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah. No, for me, past lives, exactly the same. Like it's my, I believe my number three of last year movie. Just yeah. so great. I, I really, to me, the movie is exactly as you say, like a sliding door situation, but also for me, it was more about not only the decisions you make define you, but also those decisions you kind of don't make for yourself or you almost miss out miss out on, they also define you. Those moments, you know, you're not there, define you as much, maybe even more than those you have direct effect on. And you you have you know a free will to you know act upon them. Because right. you know, she left. There is a part where he says. No, no, sorry. There's a part where she says to her husband, they, were, they are talking in bed. And she says something like, for him, I'm the one who left. For you, and she's talking to her husband, I'm the one who stayed. And as somebody who's emigrated to Scotland from Czech Republic and has been living here for this year is going to be my 13th year. I felt that in my core. Because, yeah, I've, I've had one too many calls where there was a massive family celebration back in the Czech Republic, you know, where auntie had a 50th birthday or whatever. And everybody was there. And I was the only one who was on my day shift in this job to, you know, so, you know, have a living <laughs> because I was studying and also working my way through uni. So, yeah. and I was like, fuck's sake, why am I doing this to myself? And I was sad about this. And it's the kind of thing where you understand where, those decisions you make define you, but also those moments you miss also define you to to a way, and it's uncomfortable, but also like needed sometimes to reflect on it. So past lives is amazing thing. Um, and I, because if it wouldn't have been for past lives, which I just watched recently, mm -hmm. the answer would have been Oppenheimer. For me okay. because Oppenheimer was my favorite movie of all of last year mm -hmm. and it just blew me away <laughs> yeah <laughs> anyway. nice. but um past lives uh is was my number two movie okay. of the year uh just edging out just barely killers of the flower moon because nice. um because there was just something about past lives that I don't know it just it really got me thinking about you know, your past relationships mm -hmm. and where, you know, would you ever go back to a relationship that you had with somebody when you were, when you were younger? Mm -hmm. And the answer to that is probably not because you're just different people yes. now. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but it's just the, the interesting realization and the, and the conversations that you have about that 
Um, you know, like it just, it just, I love those movies that make you think and past lives was definitely one of those movies that definitely made me think. 100% like, you know, signed, you know, exactly alongside you past lives is amazing. If you haven't, you know, watched it, you definitely should. I really hope it's going to get some Oscar love as well. It's, it's already gotten some Golden Globes nominations. So no, it's ama it's it's amazing and well deserved movie to go go get them nominations. So what is the last teen quote unquote movie you would rate five stars? And this is between anything between two thousand three and two thousand nineteen. So this is a this is an interesting call because I I kind of had a I kind of had a thought about. two of them potentially and i think the one that i because uh, when i first saw this and i thought of it i think the thing that i settled on the most was ladybird Okay. Nice. Okay. lady because it was between that and spider-man homecoming and Okay. i think for me spider-man homecoming you know it's it's more of a conventional Mm hmm coming of age like teen story and things like that but i think Lady Bird for me um just kind of represents a lot of just what what it just means to to like grow up and just evolve into the person that you are and you know Shirsha Ronan is that how you pronounce your name It's Sirsa it's Sersha. Sersha Yeah. she's you know she's easily one of our best performers regardless Yes. of gender regardless of age today Mm hmm and you know to tip my card she's she's one of my most underrated actresses out Mm there hmm now Mm because hmm she's very strategic about what she picks and she's very strategic about um the performances that she wants to do like she doesn't really do a whole lot of like shit movies or anything like that minus you know call what it is like the the Lo lovely bones movie was god awful but um but this also for me cemented greta gerwig is like oh this person knows what she's doing as well um so much so like hey we're we're gonna give you a movie about a plastic doll with quote-unquote big boobs like joe coy said Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. um and let's let's see what you can do <laughs> mm -hmm. with this and to make one of the one of the best movies of last year as well. So She did she did well. Yeah, like Greta Gerwig, she she probably knows what she's doing. <laughs> a little bit. Well, cuz cuz to me as well, I always knew Greta uh Greta Gerwig as um like the first thing that I ever saw Greta Gerwig in was um the the movie No Strings Attached, which is Oh yeah. she she was in that, she you know, wasn't a big part or anything like Mhm. that. Um she felt like she was destined to be one of those people who was just going to be a side character and just Mm that's that's about it. You don't see her leading mhm. Mm mhm. a lot of things, but maybe she figured out pretty quick. Maybe my destiny lies more behind the camera instead. And Mm I'm not gonna lie, I've seen No Strings Attached. I didn't remember she actually was in it because I've only seen it once about 15 years ago, or maybe Well, like... because because no strings attached to me was the inferior of the friends with benefits Yes. no strings attached Yeah. movies uh because you know it was just a weird movie and Yeah. yeah No, but Lady Bird is awesome. Like I need to get back to it because I I'm I'm high on it. Don't get me wrong. There's no mm hot -hmm. take here. I just didn't love it as as many people around me seem to love it. So I definitely need to get get it the rewatch now. Like you know, as I'm getting older, and I would definitely I think I'll appreciate it much more. Like with my twenty twenty four eyes than maybe my two thousand. I believe I seen it two thousand eighteen eyes. So. No, but Lady Bird is awesome. And to be fair, Homecoming is easily like uh, better, better MCU movies. One of the, I would say, probably top 10. Like, no, that's a great movie. And Tom Holland is a great Spider-Man. So which one of your adult, quote-unquote, movies would you rate 5 out of 5? Which, again... anything between 2002 and 1975 
and just to just to kind of you know put it out there these are our just you know i just pick random dates don't come for me like you know this this is just for us to discuss some variety of movies rather than last movies of last five years anyway four zeros i would say the last movie that i watched that fell kind of in this timeline that i rated five out of five mm-hmm it's a tough call because it's a, this is a humongous time time yes, frame. Yes, it is. Um, I'd probably say the last movie that I watched uh, that, or the most recent one that I watched uh, that like I hadn't seen before that I would have rated five out of five. Um, so uh, it would be Clint Eastwood's Unforgiven Ooh, from that's like ninety two. Which look, I'm not a westerns guy mm -hmm. at all. Like, okay. I just, I don't get the appeal, which is weird because I'm American and all of us <laughs> cowboys are like, blah, 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 blah. Yep. But, and Unforgiven was another one of those movies that I had been told that it was fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I was like, there's no way that this is as good as I, I think mm -hmm. it's going to be. And sure enough, yeah, it it is. And it's kind of bucks a lot of trends that, you know, typical westerns are, are in all the performances are great i'm not a huge clint eastwood guy either especially since he's gone a little off the rails lately mm -hmm. and you know ever since he you know had that conversation with the chair at like a oh, political yeah. convention recently i'm like oh i don't know about this and you know i haven't been a huge fan of a lot of the movies he's made lately like mm -hmm. i like I got into a big fight with somebody because, uh, like, a lot of my friends who have, like, spouses in the military, like, American Sniper was not, like, a great movie to mm -hmm. me because it, it's one of those movies that I think it, it feels a little war porny a little bit. And, like, like should we be celebrating these mm -hmm. these people in this way? But I got a lot of shit from people that was, like, you know, you don't understand the things that soldiers go through. I'm like, fuck you. Like, mm -hmm. like, do you like, are you a soldier yourself? You have people that you know in this. So, you know, one person's experience mm -hmm. with this, but you don't know what every single person goes through. It's different from everyone. Mm -hmm. that's, that's why we're all different. <laughs> so Lynn Eastwood has been very hit or miss for me. And to go back and to watch, you know, something like this, mm -hmm. Wow, I was I was shocked at how much I liked it. Oh no, it's it's a great one. I remember watching it a lot some time ago too, and I actually loved it. I've heard from people this is like the last big Western we've gotten, maybe until two thousand seven, where we had the uh three ten to Yuma remake. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it it ever since then it's we've had some westerns, but they were never as big or as honored because you know. There were quite a few Oscars for that movie. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was it was celebrated. And to your point, by the way, about the military, have you seen well, you're the TV show guy, right? So mm -hmm. have you watched the Curb Your Enthusiasm and the episode about how Larry decided not to thank this veteran for his service? No, I have not oh. seen that one yet. It's a great one. So yeah, it's basically exactly what you hear me say. <laughs> There's this mm -hmm. veteran, young guy, you know, just came from one of them wars. And so everybody in that room, there's like seven people and he gets introduced because he's new in a group and he's, you know, oh, I'm so-and-so. Oh, thank you. You know, I'm, my name is this. Thank you for your service. And he goes to a, 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 a second person. Oh, my name is this, this. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you for your service. And Larry is just like, Hey, nice to meet you. <laughs> and then and then everybody gets awkward and the guy obviously is waiting for it and he doesn't get it. So he's just like he gets like almost emotional. He's like, okay, can I be excused for a second? And it just, you know, it's in a typical Larry David fashion, is just, oh, everybody thank you six times. Thank you. Do I thank you for your meal all the time? Thank you for your meal. Thank you for the rice. Mm. And it's just that kind of like, you know, commentary only Larry David can do. Like th that's gonna finish, as you said. Many TV shows are ending, and th this is one of them. Soon mm -hmm. in February, we're gonna get the last season, 
but it's gonna be. I think it's gonna be great. But And, yeah, and it's. it better it better be great because you know again with with succession barry Mm -hmm. and now curb your enthusiasm ending what else does hbo have so Well, the House of Dragon. i i, I guess sure but you know how often is that going to come out whereas you know we consistently Yep. got barry succession curb until not too long ago like curb lasted what like 11 12 years even with a break so Well, if you can count the breaks, uh, two decades. Because I am pretty sure the first season is from 2000. So, because I actually binged it, or not binged it, but I started it uh, recently, kind of like five, six years ago, when it was only like eight or nine seasons. And this 12th season is coming out now. But yeah, there are always like, you know, a couple of years between seasons. So, yeah, no, Curb is awesome. <laughs> But anyway, and what is the la the old movie? Anything you know older than nineteen seventy four that you would rate five out of five? Okay, so uh, recently I have decided that I have not watched enough Hitchcock, Oh, and nice. um, one that was a pretty glaring thing on my list of shame was Vertigo, and Oh. I I finally watched Vertigo and was blown away by how innovative it was. You know how it, you know just. It's it's one of those things where if you love movies, you need to watch Bird because Mm -hmm. Yeah. it it kind of just shows like the possibilities of what what film can be, uh, what you can do with limited resources. Like, it's so weird that like Vertigo looks better than some movies today, Mm hmm and th that movie is over what sixty fifty like Sixty it was now. fifty. 58 so Yeah. it's it's old it's an old movie so Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It is. yeah And it still holds up. yeah I've introduced... still Yeah, I introduced my girlfriend to Hitchcock to some of his movies, and she loved Rear Window. mm -hmm. She really enjoyed that. And even she said, like, Grace Kelly is one of the most beautiful women she's ever seen. <laughs> So like I'm I'm so happy that I got her into those old movies as well because she's not a movie person as much as we are so which you know many people are not <laughs> let's face it well and but but not only that when you look back at some of these older movies you get a sense of oh that's where some of these tropes or some of these jokes come from exactly and i think that's what i love about watching some older movies so one of my favorite tv shows of all time is the simpsons and the simpsons have done everything Mm -hmm. Yes. and there was an episode very centric to rear window Mm -hmm. Uh, where, you know, they they kind of spoofed it in a sense. Mm -hmm. But then when you go back and you watch Rear Window, it's like, oh, I get it now. Mm I -hmm. get where they got some of these things. It's the same thing with with Vertigo. Like there are some uh, like just little things like, oh, I get why some some shows do it, do it this way now. And again, I'm strong strong uh, proponent of people going back and actually trying to appreciate where things you know come from like it's it's hard it's hard when you see something done quote unquote better in you know 2022 2023 and so on because you know it's much shinier it's much better paced you know maybe less pro problematic because you know there might be one or two jokes that don't age that well but you know if you go back and you see hey people in the 40s or 50s or 60s you know They still produced great art, and those, you know, are the titans many of our current, you know, filmmakers quote as their favorites, you know. So I honestly feel like any movie person needs to go back and needs to, like, you know, watch like a good and good amount of older movies to, you know, it just feels like almost like almost a school in a way. <laughs> where you need to know your basics and then you can appreciate movies more. And I know I'm going to be like, you know, one of them snobby movie people <laughs> like uh, on Twitter, but I'm, I'm not. I just, you know, I just love any kind of movies, really. But I try to watch a lot of old, old movies and I'm fascinated every single time how daring some of them were. 
Like I've just watched the last picture show yesterday. And it's a movie from 71, about 1951. And I didn't know how horny that movie was. Yeah. <laughs> and a big part of that, and you know, it sounds kind of sleazy. And I was talking to our friend Shane, you know, I was talking to him about it. And I was like, but I know it sounds sleazy, but hear me out. The the themes of that movie is, you know, the movie portrays this generation of, you know, growing up in 50s. We always see them as these, like, you know, larger than life, better than us generation where they they were not filthy. They were not mean. They were not this. They were always like these, like, almost regal, like, creatures or, or cowboys, right? With, like, strong morals. And no, they were just people like us that had urges that, you mm-hmm. know, l- like to fuck. Mm-hmm. And they like to have fun. And, you know, they were just humans. And it's it was fascinating to see that tiny town, that tiny community just get together. And how one guy, Sam the Lion, was the keystone of that community. And how, to an extent, everybody now is craving for some sort of community like that. So there is a there is a thing to be appreciated there. Yeah. But yeah. Thanks, yeah. So Mike, speaking of decades, what what is your favorite decade of when it comes to movies? Now you can interpret this a lot of different ways because mm-hmm. you can be like, okay, the decade that film evolved the mm-hmm. most, the mm-hmm. decade that you know, because you could argue that just even the jump from black and white to color or from sound to, or from silent to sound, yeah. you know, you know, all of that stuff. Um, or you could pick, you know, like movie that has like your favorite movies yes. in it. Um, so it could be interpreted a bunch of different ways. Mm-hmm. I, I'm going to go with the favorite route and which is why as ridiculous as it sounds, I'm going to go with the nineties because I grew up in the nineties mm-hmm. and Easily, some of my favorite movies of all time came came from this this decade. Like pretty high up there on my list: Shawshank, yep. The Matrix, yep. um, Seven. Mm-hmm. You know, different different things like that. Um, but I feel like this is the year, or this is the decade that kind of kind of helped like theater going experiences become what they are today, yep. which is to make a theater going experience more of an event Mm -hmm. versus, you know, what it was before, which was, you know, Hey, you've got eight months to, to watch this movie. It's like, no, you don't, you don't have that long to watch this movie, but Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. like, like, unless it's like a special movie, like for example, I remember going to see Jurassic park in the theater multiple times because it was just in theaters for a long time. Same thing with Titanic yes. as well. I saw Titanic four times in theaters. Um, but going to see those on the big screen, I will never forget mm. like how, how much those experiences meant to me because they shaped me into the movie-loving nerd that I am today. Mm-hmm. So um, so yeah, I would, I would say the 90s because I grew up in this and I feel like movie the movie-going experience grew up with me Mm -hmm. lame as that sounds but um and also like we got a lot of like cool innovations in the 90s too like tarantino you know fucked with story structure so much that people you know it's it's been often imitated but it's never been as good as what tarantino uh tarantino made it um Mm -hmm. you know we, we got the you know Spielberg in the in the perhaps like not absolute height of his powers, but you know Close height of it. his height of his genre flipping capabilities between Schindler's List, Jurassic Park, Saving Private Ryan. Yep, you know all, all of that stuff. Um, you know even even the advent of you know certain genres like the superhero genre could have died in the night. Like mm-hmm. and quite frankly, it probably it, did. It kind of did. Bit. Yeah. It kind of did a little bit, and thankfully, you know, like, look, I get it. Spider Man and X Men and um, 
Yeah, and those two were like credited with like the renaissance of like the the uh, can't forget about Blade that happened Mm -hmm. Oh, in Blade. the nineties, which I as as ridiculous as I think Blade is, I still love it. Me too. You know, so um, and like nineteen ninety nine and even like ninety four are like seminal years in in movie making because in ninety nine there's like a ton of like iconic and like great experimental movies that. Mm -hmm. Just, it, it was a great year for for movies like '99. It was Mm an -hmm. interesting Oh, yeah. year in general, like with all the the Y two K craziness. But Yes. I feel like 90s is the first, from what I understand, from my limited film knowledge, is the first kind of decade where Hollywood went almost, you know, indie as well, where we've gotten much more like indie stuff where they were not necessarily produced to make shit ton of money at the box office, but Yeah. they could, they relied on, hey, maybe this will, you know, do something in a cinema, but we'll recoup our, you know, investment in the DVDs and the VHSs, you know, and all of those, you know, are... And that, you know, gave way to, like, Soren Sorenbergs of our, you know, of this era that gave way, even, like, Tarantino, like, because he, he wasn't probably, like, that profitable of a guy because you could, you know, R-rated movies, they're not, they're doing, they can do well, but, you know, not all the time. They historically don't do that well. Yeah. And, no, but 90s, I have a feeling, because most... movie uh most directors if you talk to them and i listen and i haven't talked to any but i listen to dga podcast about the directors talking to each other and most uh influential directors they always quote 70s how they grew up watching 70s movies and they go back to the 70s because of the like there was a first like a dirty decade where movies became more of a like a european almost thing where There's more nudity, there's more sex, there's more violence, there's more everything in the real life stuff. And I have a sneaky suspicion in a next decade or so, we will get the many new directors that grew up in the 90s, like us. And they were influenced by directly by Tarantino in the 90s, by Spielberg in the 90s, and all these like ti even tinier movie, you know, movie movie people who have told stories all throughout the 90s. And because 90s genuinely is a great decade for movies it's no yeah it is i don't think it's underappreciated i think it's no I, I don't think it's a hot take it's 90s are would be one of my favorite decades too to be honest but speaking of hot, hot takes what about some movie hot takes do you have some Um, not, so, I'm trying to think of hot takes mm-hmm because, um, you know, there, there's some obviously like low hanging fruit, like superhero genre needs, you know, a little bit of a, a reboot and Yeah. things like that. and needs to like go back to basics. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess like one of my biggest hot takes, uh, for TV, for movies nowadays is that I do hate, like, and I, this isn't really a take, I'm sure like. Plenty of people agree with this is that I don't like that we're in this phase where the where television is like the television style, not like television shows becoming movies, has crossed into TV a or into movies a little too much. Mm hmm And I'm I'm not a huge fan of that because Okay. if I want certain if if I want my TV shows or my movies to feel a little bit more like a TV show, then fuck you, make it into a TV show. But I, I get it because profitability and cinematic universes are a thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Um, I'm just wondering when this fad is going to be done. Like same thing with the, I thought we were done with this part one fad. Like Mm hmm when hunger games, mocking Jay part one and like twilight breaking dawn part one. I thought that shit was over, but here we are back again with Mm. Yep. this, this part one stuff. And I think oftentimes people lose sight of like, hey, if you're going to make a part one, you still have, or if you're going to make a part two of something, you still got to make a good part one. Yes. And that's, that's not happening now. And it's, Mm it's hmm frustrating. Um, and like, I don't know, I guess, I guess one of my hot takes is that I don't miss the theater going experience as much as I hoped I would. Okay. And, and it makes me a little bit sad Mm But hmm also, like, it's weird going to the, like, and it's probably, it's, it's partially my fault because Mm hmm I also go to the movie theater at weird times. Like, 
I have to go when like the kids are all asleep and like I don't get to go when like the theater's full anymore. Like I saw Killers of the Flower Moon with like six people in the theater. Mm -hmm. And when I went to go like the closest the closest time that I saw a movie and the theater was packed was when I went to go see Oppenheimer. Yeah. Like all the other times I've gone, like the theater's been like relatively like mid sized to like empty. Mm -hmm. So Which So you is missed why that bus you have around you when you're watching a movie. it isn't that part of the reason why you go to the theater to share that experience with other people, even if you don't talk to them Mm -hmm. afterwards, which is why like this whole day and date and like things like that. Like I wish people um, so I don't know. It's, It sucks that we're in a situation now where, like, you have to, like, I wish streamers and theaters would find a way, a better way to coexist as opposed to compete with Yeah. one another. Yes. So... See, like, okay, you asked me a question, so I didn't want to interrupt. I I think I'm kind of in the minority. I love going to the cinema, but I love going to the cinema where, like, you know, on a second or third week, I actually intentionally wait and don't go the opening weekend because I don't really like when... Or oh, this person's, you know, like there's a, I don't know, maybe you, maybe people in the, in the United States are much better behaved, <laughs> but like <laughs> there's like, you know, there's a touching scene that, you know, everybody should be quiet. And there's this person like shuffling their popcorn. There is that person that's opening their other like candy bag. And it's just like, and it's like, or, or, or people fall asleep. <laughs> I've watched. I've I I've been in theaters where people have fallen asleep. Um, Mm -hmm. I've been in theater like I also hate when people clap at the end of at the end of movies. Like fuck you, this is not a like a play or anything like that. They can't hear you clapping Yeah. or anything like that. Like cheering is like I'm even on the fence about cheering Mm -hmm. in the middle of of a movie as well. Like. Mm -hmm. I get it. Like I got caught up in the moment, like for Spider Man, uh, No Way Home, and Avengers Endgame. Yeah, I admit it. But at the same time, it's like, God, I hate. Like I hated when somebody clapped at the end of the last movie I saw in theaters, which was Wish. Like I hate it. Like why are you clapping at this? Like first of all, this was a terrible movie. But second of all, like. Why you're Mm you're tepidly clapping like it because I knew it was an adult as well. Yeah. If it's a kid, like kid gets a little bit of slack on that. Yeah. See that okay, that's that's definitely not a thing in the UK. The only time I experienced it was believe it or not, during the 2012 Let's Miser Up. When that movie ended, that was the first time where I be I was in a theater. It wasn't packed by any means, but it was like maybe 30, 40 people, if I remember correctly. And spontaneously, most of us, including myself, kind of got up and like started to clap because we were all in this fucking moment. <laughs> and it, because it felt like a, it felt like a production, right? Because it is a musical. And again, I'm not a person who would clap when in plain lands. I wouldn't clap in any other movie. But it was something about that moment where I just, you know, felt like a mu- musical where it just... That was the only time I remember where a movie in in UK stood up and like kind of clapped. So, but yeah, like I'm I'm kind of you know I'm cheering. I've seen uh, the like you know End Game or No Way Home or you know stuff like that in a cinema, a reasonably packed cinema. So we I don't think we've had cheering if I remember correctly. So like I always hear stories from you guys in America how. people would cheer at this scene and this scene. And I'm like, well, thank fuck this doesn't happen here. Yeah. Well, and then there are some awkward movies that there's cheering at the end of it or Mm -hmm. like clapping. Like I got to admit the movie that I saw in theaters that had the most awkward clapping moment on the face of the planet was when I went to go see the passion of the Christ. Like, (laughs) why are we clapping at this? Yes. Jesus died. um, Yes. Like, Are are you all celebrating Jesus's death? Are you like, I I get it. People were very moved by that movie, and it is, 
dare I say, Passion of the Christ is now slightly underrated Mm -hmm. in a sense because I don't think it got enough credit for what it was able to accomplish, despite the fact that it was made by a total d bag. Yeah. But and like Jim Caviezel has just gone completely off the rails now. Yep. But yeah, just I. If I want to clap at the end of a performance, I'll go see a theater performance or mm -hmm. a band or something like that. Not a movie. Like, yeah, stop, stop it. No, I'm. Um, I'm um, to be fair. Again, only happened once to me, and yeah, I don't feel like clapping in a in, in a cinema. It doesn't really make sense, does it? But uh, do you have any other hot takes before no. we move on? No, okay, we are all hot taked out then. <laughs> all all hot taked out. It's all good. So now well, let's go to the part where we, or you, Mike, give me what you perceive are the underrated actors, actresses, movies, directors, and TV shows. So let's start with who do you think would be one or two most underrated actors at this moment? Well, it's it's weird because I I had before before Oppenheimer, mm -hmm. I, I thought I thought. Killian Murphy or Cilli Killian, right? Murphy yeah. was a little underrated. Mm -hmm. And he just hadn't gotten a chance to, you know, to break out and yeah. to so he he was pretty high up there on my list. Um I think Oon McGregor is a little underrated oh, yes. as well. Um because I will never forget when I saw Moulin Rouge for the first Same. time. Like it's one of my favorite movies of all time. Same. It's it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And man, Ewan McGregor's got some pipes. He's oh, really yes. good. And because before that, I was like, this fucking guy, this guy from Train Spotting, is mm -hmm. you know, really. And then I saw it and was like, oh. And then the prequels came out for Star uh, for Star Wars, which we've talked about. Shameless yes. plug for that, but. Like to this day, he's still one of the best parts of that, and there's a reason why people were clamoring so much to have him back in Obi Wan. Yeah. So, I I would have to like those two right now are like probably pretty high up there in terms of my underrated mm -hmm. people, and you know, I, I wish still they, they I think you know like you're silly and Mar Murphy. You know, it's exactly correct. I think many people know know of him, uh, you know, through Peaky Blinders. Another mm -hmm. show I still haven't had a chance to see, and I know it's supposed to be great. It is on my list, but you know, he's been like steady for us movie people. Like you know, whether it was Sunshine, whether it was Twenty Eight Days Later, you know, we've known and we know him. Like he is great. But yeah, and like now, I'm so grateful that he had the chance in Oppenheimer to finally have a leading role and to actually showcase exactly how great he is. Mm -hmm. And I hope something similar, you know, you and McGregor would have his chance again for something similar impact where, you know, he would have, he would have some sort of leading role. So both very great picks, like honestly. So what about the actress? Oh, so I said one of them already, uh, Sir Sharonin is pretty mm -hmm. pretty high up there. Yes. Um so so one one actress that I think is underrated now mm -hmm. because she hasn't had like a lot of like flashy roles or anything like that. But when I saw May December and Julianne Moore oh, uh, yeah. in that um man, I was I was blown away because you know that whole time I was like yeah, she's not that bad. Mm -hmm. And then that part at the graduation was like, oh, I get it. I get what's happening now. Mm -hmm. Um mm -hmm. that just oh, that that just it gave me it gave me chills. It gave me chills. It was it was really great. Um uh like a couple other ones because like I, I look back at the Sif Pop, because I did the Sif Pop, you know, review the review roundup for October. Yep. And some of the ones in there, like I'd consider are underrated. Like I, I think Kiernan Chipka is a little underrated mm -hmm. uh, at this point. She hasn't just gotten a lot of, she hasn't gotten a lot of roles, but I, I like Kiernan Shipka. Um, 
I wouldn't call Emily Blunt underrated now because she's, but I, I do kind of think she's a little underrated. I feel like she is kind of uh, with the same conversation as Julianne Moore, and Julianne Moore is an Oscar winner, so it's it's weird to say, but I actually know what you mean because it seems like both of them have kind of stepped back a bit, so they are not as visible as they once were, maybe because there was a period of time where especially Julianne Moore seemed to be in like two movies a year for like uh, there was a stint, and same with Emily Blunt, and Emily Blunt still I believe. She still hasn't gotten her Oscar, and it's sh- you know she should get one. So, hundred percent, yeah, agree. Any more on your list? So there's there's one other one. Um, mm-hmm. trying to get her name. Um, it's a uh, because I I watched the movie Fair Play with Alden uh, Ehrenreich, who is who's yes. also underrated mm-hmm. at this point. Um. But but the girl Phoebe, uh, I, I'm gonna struggle with that last name. <laughs> Dinavar or D- Dinavar or something like that. I know, yeah. Um, she she's from Bridgerton, and yes, she's always going to be the Bridgerton girl, mm-hmm. unfortunately. Um, but I saw her in this and was like, okay, she was great. She was great in that. As fucked up as that movie was, yes. it she she was great in it, and I think I think I need to kind of calibrate my what underrated means because mm-hmm. I think at this point underrated is probably not the same as underused, oh, like yeah. or just not in enough yet. I think mm-hmm. her and Kiernan Shipka are in that, but I think Julianne Moore. I think despite the fact that she's been an Oscar winner, mm-hmm. she. I don't think she gets enough appreciation for mm-hmm. the work that she does. No, 100%. And I wonder if she purposefully stepped back for a couple of years, or maybe she just feels like she's not getting enough good roles because of her age. Because I know that was a big part of many actresses, such as Meryl Streep, have commented on this phenomenal over the years where Hollywood, if you're a woman in Hollywood or a certain age, you're just not getting many scripts or many great scripts. So... I've always hoped that's changed now, but you know, I would love to hear their perspective on it because obviously they are living it. Yeah. No, but no, that's yeah, then a fair play. I've just watched it the other week. It is an it it, it isn't a movie, yes. It's a it's an interesting movie. <laughs> so, Mike, what is your underrated director? Who who would you say is like the one of the most underrated directors? So I've I've got a couple options right now. And I think my top option right now for underrated directors might actually be Kevin Smith right now because okay. Kevin Smith, he built up his reputation with Clerks mm-hmm. and arguably the Clerks trilogy of movies um, is among one of the better movies or better trilogies out there compared to some of the other ones. Um, by no means am I saying it's like one of the greatest things ever, but Kevin Smith has also made a name for making weird, zany movies, and he's done a cinematic universe better than most of these other people out there combined. Mm -hmm. So I give Kevin Smith a lot of credit for that. Plus, I love almost all of his movies, maybe not some of his more recent stuff, but, Mm -hmm. you know, there's there's a place for all of them. Um, It it sounds weird because I think what like. I, we're going to go through three layers of underrated directors, in my opinion. So I I kind of think right now Danny Boyle is getting to be slightly underrated. And yes, I understand because you're giving me that look like he's an Oscar winner. Like, why mm-hmm. would you consider him underrated? Because I just think lately a lot of people have been maybe not as appreciative of some of the stuff that Danny Boyle has put out past mm-hmm. that has been good he he hasn't done a whole lot lately i think what his most recent movie was maybe what yesterday maybe i believe so so i'm just so checking yeah. it right now yeah i'm just checking it right now because i was like did he even win an oscar and slumdog slumdog yes slumdog no, yeah. he did he did and that that's a to be fair that is a great movie yes yes and yeah yesterday is his last movie which I thought yesterday was okay. 
like you know it was it was it was pretty good but like it definitely i expected a bit more Yes, and I would have to agree. yes and to your point about kevin smith i like that pick i have do you know why you mentioned that you don't really like most uh, some of his like newer stuff do you know why he's made movies like tusk or what was the other one about like with johnny depp and his daughter The, the you know yoga yoga hosers. yeah yoga was Maybe. a, do you know why he's made I those movies I'm I'm assuming he's kind of in this I don't give a fuck phase anymore and kind of doing whatever he wants, especially post heart attack, where he's Mm -hmm. like, I'm just gonna make the movies that I want, but I I don't know the real reason why. Mm -hmm. He uh, he mentioned it in an interview someplace where he reckons he showed up so quickly and he made so many great movies or good movies that he never had the experimental career he wanted to have. So after a certain period of time, he just said, you know what, I'll just make whatever fuck I want. And even even if it's not gonna be the, my best work, it's gonna be my work or something along those lines. So I was like, all right, I can. And you know, like Task, for example, I kind of liked. I can, like it's not a like it's not his like best movie. I'm not gonna argue that. Or it's or I'm not even gonna say it's underrated. It's just beautifully twisted. So if you want to watch a, like some sort of beautifully twisted sick movie. Dusk might be a great pick. Um, because be, between those two and Red State, which again, Oh, <laughs> red those state. are all, those those are all those are all a very big departure from what Kevin Mm -hmm. Smith has done in the past, and even his when he dips back into his you know the view askew verse Mm -hmm. with things like Clerks Two, Clerks Three, Jay and Silent Bob reboot. Those have, those were never as good as you know those original movies like the Clerks, the Mallrats, the Chasing Amy's, Mm -hmm. anything like that. Yeah. However, that doesn't change the fact that I I still I still enjoy them for the nostalgia, and I thought Clerks Three was surprisingly heavy, and Clerks Two is actually my favorite of the Clerks trilogy. So I Mm -hmm. Yeah. have a soft spot. For, for all of that but you're, you're right at least he he's swinging for the fences he wants to do what he wants to do um Mm hmm yeah there's there's something admirable about that and also he is not i'm not saying he's definitely on the same level as tarantino in terms of bringing about this new wave of indie mm hmm filmmaking but he's he's pretty high up there in terms of one of the people that helped spearhead that that movement I mean, to an extent, he, like, after Tarantino, he would definitely be in the top three filmmaking, like, new filmmakers that helped shape in the 90s. Because that's when he really broke through. Like, Clerks was, what, 94, I, I, I want to say? Give or take, yeah. So, like, he definitely shaped that decade, you know, and then pretty much, you know, he was, well, there was a, before Jude Apatow came, you know, on scene, he was the com comedy guy, really. You know, if you had a comedy directed by and written by Kevin Smith, you knew you were going to be in for a good time. So, and to be fair, you mentioned Red State, I completely forgot. I've seen it once and I've unapologetically loved it. Like, I don't know if I were to rewatch it, if I would still love it. But uh, I just had such a blast with that movie. Such a great movie. Mm -hmm. Speaking of movies, though, speaking of movies, what would you say... It's like are some of your like underrated movies? Yeah. This is this is a tough call because I think everyone's definition of underrated is is different, which Mm -hmm. you know, that's part of the fun of asking a question like Yeah. this. So if I'm kind of looking through some of my favorite movies right now and ones that I would consider underrated at this point um so i think i think the first one that comes to mind for me that's kind of in my top movies um i'm gonna go with uh and this is also a director that i think is slightly underrated as well uh it's thank you for smoking uh it's two 2005 um about nick naylor who's played by uh aaron eckhart you know Yes. pre pre dark night and very much on the rise and somebody who's like i don't think he's achieved the stardom that i think even he was hoping for uh Yep. at this point but he's still a solid actor but thank you for smoking solidified for me that jason reitman is someone that i i need to watch out for in terms of great movies that he makes because you know between that 
up in the air, Juno. Um, yep. Even even the new Ghostbusters movie, which I know not everyone loved, but I think a lot of people should still consider it a good one. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. so thank you for smoking is is definitely up there. Um, I'm a big fan of the movie Stranger Than Fiction with Okay. the you know Will Ferrell's you know one of his many turns to try to you know go into more slightly more dramatic roles, but I. I love Stranger Than Fiction, uh, you know, for for a variety of reasons. Um, let's see what else is out. Mm -hmm. Well, while you're looking, I'm I'm just gonna you know basically agree with everything you said about especially thank you for smoking. That was my introduction to Aaron Eckhart, and I was like, this dude has you know some chops. And it was as you said, that was just before I watched it just before The Dark Knight, so that, that's where he kind of blew up. And that's what solidified Jason Reitman for me. And then up in the, you know, up in the air it was a great movie. And I, you know, now we're having the this Nepo baby conversation. He's definitely one of my favorite Nepo babies. Like, you know, he definitely and you know, let truth be told, he is a Nepo baby, but he is a very, you know, he's a very talented one. I I would have to agree with that. Um, yeah, he's he's solid. He's Mm-hmm. you know one two punch, and he's made a variety of movies that you know kind of rivals what Ivan Reitman did his dad. So Yep. you know I give him a lot of credit uh, for that. Um, I think one last one that I I don't know if it's underrated, but when you compare it to some of the other ones within the catalog for this studio. I do think it's a little underrated and that's Coco because Mm. Oh, yes. so I've seen a fair amount of Pixar movies with my, my now wife and there, there have been two in particular that have made her cry a lot. Like when she went to go see inside out, cause I didn't go see it with her. She saw it for her, not her bachelorette party, but her pre wedding celebration with friends she didn't want to call it a bachelorette party and they went to a pancake house and they went to go see inside out and Nice. the one two punch of going to see that and the short in front of it which was the one about the volcanoes um Yeah, lava. Mm -hmm. trying to have my wife and my sister talk to me about both of those they're both talking over each other they're both crying i was like What is this? What's going on? And Coco, I don't think Coco gets put up there enough with in the terms of the Pixar pantheon because Pixar has made a lot of great movies. And I think, unfortunately, it's gotten kind of buried in the shuffle because Coco came out kind of at the tail end of when when Pixar was making like truly original content and Yep. not and they were just at the beginning of like, hey, we're going to make a shitload of sequels. And you're just going to deal with it for now. And now Pixar feels like it's the redheaded stepchild of, of Disney. Disney. And all the, all the Pixar stuff is going straight to Disney plus. And now they've even kind of conceded. Yeah, this was a mistake. And now they're releasing all those things in theaters. I, like I want, I wonder how that's going to go over uh, Mm -hmm. for these next three that are the three that are coming out that went straight to Disney plus. And I hope that Disney kind of gets off their high horse and realize, you know, all these other things that we, we own, I guess should be considered just as good in terms of quality instead of just everything being branded. Oh, Disney brand is
except now there have been two occasions. I've cried twice. And Coco was my very first movie I ever cried to. Like when I watched it for the first time, well, and only time, because I don't know if I can watch it again. The last scene with the grandma, uh, mm-hmm. just that just got me. I don't know if it was because of my own grandma. Grandmother died like a year prior to that. Or the idea how if, you know, you 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 only are, you know, you only properly die when the last person ever mentions your name. And, you know, that's when you properly vanish. Mm-hmm. And just, you know, something like culminated within that movie and that moment. I just was like, yeah, that, that just got me. So, yeah. Coco, I, I'm 100% there with you. It is underrated. Like, you know, it's a it's a kind of, you know, in a in a Pixar studio, such a bohemian as Pixar are. Oh, yeah, it's very hard to say Coco should be higher, but it, I, yes, it should be higher. Like, it... Mm-hmm. And I would even go as far, like, maybe Soul, since then, maybe, there was, you know, Soul was very good as well. Like, I would say that that was a great one. But mm-hmm. yeah, since Soul and Coco, you know, it's not very, you know, straightforward. Like every Pixar is a hit or every Pixar, as you, as you put it, has the emotional gut punch we, we would usually be looking for. Mm-hmm. So those are some great picks. Thank you. But, yeah, <laughs> I, would have, I would have to Of agree. course. And of course, having you here, you are the TV guy. So I need to ask you, what in your mind is the most underrated TV show? That's a hard question uh, because lately I have just been watching so much TV lately Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. it's hard to pick one thing that is, I would deem underrated because it's kind of based on a lot of different things. Cause if you're looking at whole body of work, Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, cause that this move, this show that I'm going to talk about, that's going to be my answer because it's the whole body of work how it started, how it, you know, how the cast interacts with one another. But if you also look at something as, now this may be a bit of a a stretch in terms of saying underrated because it's been going on forever and it's almost Mm -hmm. unfair to say that The Simpsons is underrated, but Mm -hmm. I don't think people give The Simpsons enough credit for that 10-year stretch when The Simpsons was absolutely dominant in terms Mm -hmm. of pop culture relevance in terms of funny and just comedy and truly some heartfelt and great moments. Now it is just merely a shell of itself. I am just wondering how much longer it's going to go on in order for me to find, like in order for me to finally see like the end of the Simpsons. Um, Mm -hmm. But we'll we'll see. But um, my, my real answer is Mm -hmm. the good place. The reason why I say The Good Place is among one of the most underrated shows out there is because The Good Place, it does not get enough credit for what it was able to accomplish with a stacked mm-hmm. cast. Look, I get it because Ted Danson is TV royalty. Like, yeah. there, There's no denying that. But the other issue that we kind of run into with Ted Danson is that he's done a lot of stuff lately. And it hasn't been great, but Mm -hmm. Ted Danson was fantastic in The Good Place. And the same thing kind of goes with Kristen Bell, because I am I am forever going to be a Veronica Mars stan. I I will sing up and down the praises of the show Veronica Mars as Mm -hmm. ridiculous as a show it is um, about like a kid detective in high school. It was very like neo-noir in that sense. But the Good Place kind of solidified that Kristen Bell actually has a lot of acting chops and mm-hmm. she has a lot of a lot more range and depth. It also introduced me to a lot of other performers. I was like, oh, a lot of these people I wish are more successful and more yeah. well known than they are right now. Um, so like, for example, well, William Jackson Harper, who plays Cheating, who is a philosopher who you know, talks a lot about how philosophy shapes his life, but he's super anxious. He's fantastic. And he's been great in everything that he does, Mm -hmm. but he's not like a household name yet because 
He hasn't been in anything of huge significance yet. He hasn't been in that blockbuster. And when there were internet rumors out there saying, you know what? This guy should be Mr. Fantastic. I was all for it. But mm -hmm. that's never going to happen because I think everybody looks at the Fantastic Four movie for Disney and is like, yeah, we need to get somebody in here who's going to be a powerhouse. And like they just don't think that he can do it. And it's too bad because he is awesome. Yeah. Uh, and then like another person uh, that's in this, uh, her name is Darcy Carden, who uh, she plays Janet. And she's great. She was in... The League of Their Own reboot, uh, short-lived Amazon thing, uh, but she was she was fantastic in that too. And I I love there's there is an epic twist at the end of the se first season of The Good Place that once you kind of once you get it, it's like oh that's good, that's really really good. And then <laughs> what starts out as a simple comedy turns into a lot of a lot of great discussion about what it means to be a good person and a lot of great discussions about what it means to actually get into heaven. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of talk about religion and how, you know, it's so much harder to get into or to be a good person nowadays because you're being scrutinized for everything and everything has an agenda. Um, and even the ending, um, they have this really great discussion about why heaven is in such a funk and the solution that they kind of come up with is like, oh, that that really makes sense because it's also a great metaphor for life as well. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. If you have not caught The Good Place, it's four seasons. It's a quick it's a, a quick run of a show. Um It's definitely up there for some of my favorite um, shows out there, especially if. You're looking for a show that it's got a little bit of everything. So if you're looking for a show that um, if you're looking for a show that, that makes you think, makes you cry, makes you smile, um, this this is a show for you. I'm definitely. It's been on again. It's even on my ever growing list of TV shows to check out. It's def, it's near to top because I've heard so many good things. And yeah, you know, just you hear, hearing you talking about it, like it definitely bumped it up even more. So I'm I just, I cannot wait to watch it. I've heard great things. I, I've heard there are some twists and turns, but luckily I didn't, don't think I've heard anything like concrete yet. Mm -hmm. So I don't think anybody's like spoiled it for me. So that's, I'm, you know, I'm uh, thankful for that. But yeah, so no, those, that's a, that's a great recommendation. Uh, so lastly, do you have any question for me? Because, you know, I've been asking you all these questions. So let's turn the tables and, you know, let's hear what you have. So the biggest question I have for you is, and I'm not sure if we've talked about it before, but I'm very curious. Mm -hmm. What was life like growing up in the Czech Republic? And okay. why, why Scotland? Uh, life was fun in Czech Republic. Oh, oh yeah, like I don't I don't want to make it seem like oh Czech Republic is this like shithole of a country that like no it's not it's, it's like there it, you know it's it's a very nice country I'm sure mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I'm I'm just curious because I I don't know a whole lot about what life is like outside the mm -hmm. US so I'm yeah. just about that Well I grew up on in this you know I grew up on this like tiny village for a bit of my life and then we moved to a slightly larger city. And yeah, it's basically like the reason, like I think Czech Republic is perfectly fine place to live. We, I still think many Czech people, like the greatest thing for me is many people are atheists. So religion really doesn't rule many people's lives. So we try to, you know, be mindful but we try to follow reason rather than just some you know bible or quran or anything like that uh i think the reason i left and the reason i went to you know came to scotland is first to study here and second i grew up poor or not rich so you know and i wanted to do something better and i wanted to have something better and i didn't think i'm gonna have it while you know at that place when I, you know, where I, you know, grew up. 
So I, you know, it, it was quite clear to me that either I need to move to Prague or I'm going to need to move outside. So, you know, of Czech Republic. And there was a opportunity for me to move to Scotland where they would cover my tuition fees. However, I would have to work my way through college and then uni. And I said, you know what, let's do this. And it's been crazy, uh, crazy time because obviously as any student who has to work for a living tells you, there's n- not enough time, you know, so you either work or you're, you're in school or when you're supposed to study, you just, you know, you work. So it's hard to balance everything. And, it, you know, looking back at it, I'm not quite sure what I would want to do it ever again. But it definitely made me appreciate, you know, when I have free time, it made me very appreciative of what I have now. Because everything I have now, I've built pretty much myself with, the, you know, with the help of many other wonderful people I've met in Scotland. But I had to put in the hours, the work and everything. So, you know... I think the biggest difference growing up he- or growing up in Czech Republic and here is kind of the attitude of like, you know, the people's attitude towards life and towards certain new things. And I think because of our past, Czech Republic is still, we are still maybe 20 years behind everybody else a bit. So like in, for example, like LGBTQ rights and stuff like that. It's still kind of spicy topic, you know, in 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 there for, for especially for the older generation. Yeah, but you know, again, isn't, no country. Isn't, yeah, isn't that true? A lot of places in the world, though, where people yes. are still struggling with LGBTQ topics, mm-hmm. particularly older generations. Like, because I feel like we grew up in an age where mm-hmm. there was there was awareness and. Yep. There's more of an understanding that, you know, these are people mm-hmm. in our lives and they're just like the rest of us, but it just... To an extent, like, yes. It... No, to an extent, yes. I would I would imagine, yeah. Like, again, I can only judge from what I've seen and what I can, you know, read online from, like, different, like, different discussion forums and stuff like that, which, again, they, I need to remind myself, they do not represent everybody, right? No, but you see the... Either. But you see the extremes. You see either the extremeness of, oh yeah, let's let's do everything and doesn't matter what you know what happens after, or let's not do anything, you know, and let's let's stay traditional, quote unquote, whatever that means. And you know, I again, I feel like the diff, the biggest difference between living here in Scotland and living in Czech Republic is the just the attitude towards life, and how I feel like here people tr- try to appreciate life more in a sense, like, you know, they, they try to travel more. They try to like be appreciative of what they have and they, and this might sound a bit mean, but sometimes, you know, I've encountered that people root for each other m- much more here, like honestly root for each other rather than be envious of each other. So, yeah, but again, I'm you know, I've only been brought up in one region that's quite specific. You know, and I'm I'm not from Prague or you know, so that you know, it might have been too diff- way too different if I were to live there. But yeah, no, I'll definitely stay here. I I will only go back there to you know to see my family, to see my friends. That those few I still have left are I still talk to on a regular basis. But yeah. Like I've made my life here. I've made some roots here, and I th- I think I'm doing well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. Let's see, another question I have for you. Um. Mm-hmm. Give me give me some because again, as as an American, I don't mm-hmm. really I I don't watch enough foreign movies or anything okay. like that. But mm-hmm. do you have any favorite? You know, do you have a favorite director from Czech Republic or anything like that, or just anything Mm -hmm. outside of the U.S. that you could possibly recommend for me to, you know, expand my cultural Mm -hmm. horizons? I do, and you've definitely heard of him, or at least heard of his movies. Milos Forman, that's the most famous one, you know, two-time Oscar, you know, Oscar winner. One uh, one of the, uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, you know, 
was the year where where that beat Jaws, for example, which is insane. Yeah. Uh, just, you know, yeah, but Foreman and how his story, there's a documentary, if you can ever find it. And if it, I don't know if it was released with English subtitles, because it's mostly in Czech, because it follows him, right? But it's about his life. It's like a four hour documentary that's like made like into like a one hour part. So you can watch it as a TV show almost. And it's called What Doesn't Kill You. I believe that's how it's translated. And it's about like how his life, what he had to endure, how he had to uh, emigrate be uh, be because of the communism and how the Russians have occupied us in 68 and how he basically was forced to emigrate to America and how he struggled there and why he landed, you know, one flew over the cuckoo's nest and, you know, Michael Douglas talks, you know, talks uh, about Foreman there, you know, the beautifully... Catherine Zeta Jones is there also because obviously she's his wife. And there are many, like, you know, there's a, there, he talks about how he probably was the last person to see Francois Truffaut, another legendary director, alive because they were pals at the time. And he talks about how he saw him in Paris the day before he died and how what they just you know how they discussed like movies and art and he puts it in such an eloquent way even though like you know you can tell English is like me English is not my first language you can, pro you can probably tell sometimes and it's just you know no but he his movies have always been fascinating to me and just when I saw that documentary back in like 2008 or 9 I was like this is this is kind of great because that's you know this shows me that no matter where you're from like you know he made it and he made it big in hollywood so you know anything is really possible last question i have for you is right. you mentioned the first movie that made you cry mm -hmm. what's the other one <laughs> this this might be i don't this is one of those movies i know it exactly but here's the thing this is one of those movies everybody loved until it won the best picture at the Oscars. Uh -huh. And then and then all the jokes started how this this Hallmark movie won an Oscar. So yes, I'm talking about Coda. Oh, yeah, that that one got me good. And yeah. I did I did hate the the, uh, the discourse about that because, you know, Apple is this discount studio. They're not focused mm -hmm. on, you know, mm -hmm. on making quality content. Like I, I disagree. I, I think Apple makes pretty good content. And I think Coda Especially was now was was really was really outstanding so yeah, again that, before uh, the oscars before the oscars you know there was like oh this little movie is so amazing full of heart everybody should watch it then it gets nominated then it gets all you know most of the awards and then and then people start with well this whole mark movie just won a best picture oscar so anything is possible and yeah like, yeah that's a fucking take okay i i hate the revisionist history that people people have about it it's like was it was it really deserving of the best picture? It's like fuck you. Yes, it was. It was it was really great. Um, Look, it that... made me cry twice. Like it made me cry twice. I'll just to answer your question fully. Uh, the first time when in, when uh, before the ending, when her family sees her singing for the first time, and they cannot, and then you can see it from their perspective. And then when she puts uh his uh, his father's hands on on her throat while she sings, I was like Jesus. Fuck, this is good. No, like this, this just got me good. Yeah, the the part where she starts signing while singing mm -hmm. as well. Oh, that yes. part, that part got me. And then when he, when her dad says go, I I think that was the last time that like I sobbed during a mm -hmm. movie, uh, mm -hmm. watching that. Uh, there have been times that I've gotten pretty close, but not since not since Coda did. Mm -hmm. Did a movie got me good? Like, sure, I'll admit everything, everywhere, all at once got me a couple of times, but not to the same extent that Coda did. Like, you know, the the laundry and taxes line to me is legendary, yes. um, but it it just didn't have the same effect that Coda did. And there's nothing wrong with that. Mm. Movies have different effects for everybody, but I think yeah, the last time that I like was truly moved by a movie was Coda, and all these people were like. Well, you know, it was it had the narrative. Like, no, it didn't. Mm -hmm. Like, stop it. Yeah. No, but everything everywhere. I've I've watched it twice in a cinema, so once by myself and once with my girlfriend. And the second time around, the laundry like almost got me. Like it, I was I was on the edge. So 
I have a feeling when I were to, if I were to rewatch it for a third time, which will happen because I love that movie. I think that's just going to be, yeah, that's going to be a third movie. But anyway, so this, this has been a long recording. So I, I am so appreciative of your time. Thank you so much for being here. I n- know that I know you much better now than I, you know, before this recording. And I'm grateful for that. So if people want to follow you, Mike, where would they go? So if you want to follow me personally... Uh, Mm -hmm. I am on Instagram, Threads, Blue Sky, just fake Twitter, and Mm -hmm. serialized at MLHilty2452. Mm -hmm. You could follow my one of the podcasts that I'm on, which is uh, Geek Speak Louder Than Nerds with a fellow Sip Pop friend, Nick. Uh, We talk about TV shows that we like and, and such. I write for Sif Pop. I write for Scribe Magazine, mainly focusing on TV stuff. And then finally, you can check out all the random shows that we're going to be trying to put on with this rinky-dink little SPDM networks that I'm trying to trying to start. If anybody is ever interested in getting into podcasting, you know, reach out and let's let's see if you can you can do this because everything starts with a good idea. You just need the right push to make it happen so that is correct and you can find me on letterboxd and x or twitter in movies lost and i also have a blog or uh lost in movies.co.uk where i post reviews twice a week and of course on this podcast now flicks and chill that is part of spdm crew podcast media and that's the end of this very first episode so until then i'll speak to you later Bye bye